Good evening, everyone. We'll call the meeting to order. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we've got a power-packed agenda this morning. I mean, this mm -hmm. evening. We'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> it already morning. feels like tomorrow morning. <laughs> it may um, be tomorrow morning. So we ask your patience, and we'll move through this the best uh, that we can. Um, we're going to move the agenda around a little bit with the uh, concurrence of um, council so that we're going to start with item 4-1 an old business consideration of a memorandum of agreement with the u.s army corps of engineers for the wilmington harbor project uh, we'll still do the prayer and invocation we'll the invocation, invocation. And oh. david do you want to i might have it but if no no it's, it's your invocation and pledge Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I have, I'm trying to move the meeting along, and I've totally, uh, yes, invocation and pledge of allegiance. Councilman Chula, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we have far too many blessings to count. We pray that you share these blessings with those in need around the world, struggling to survive. Please open our eyes so that each of us can help broaden your work and make our world a better place for everyone. We're thankful for all you have given us, including the courage to make the right decisions for our community. Please give us the strength to prioritize our tasks tonight, embracing each challenge that comes our way with an open mind and a heart that's focused on the love and compassion we have for each other. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Bob. A mayor is always learning, and tonight I learned, stick to the agenda. <laughs> um, David, do you want to introduce... Yes, uh, tonight, project. yes, ma'am. Tonight we have from the core Bob Kiesler. Uh, he's going to come up and talk about a little bit about the Wilmington Harbor project that we're going to ready to undertake this um, next year. Uh, but he can give you an update and let you know what's going on with that project. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for being here. Good evening. Thanks for having me. And it's honor to work with the town of Oak Island. And uh, best wishes from Colonel Morgan for David Kelly and his retirement. Um, I'm Bob Keister. I'm with the Wilmington District Corps of Engineers. Um, I'm with the project management section. Um, we have done, uh, we're in the process of doing our navigation dredging for Wilmington Harbors. So one of three contracts of the year. We dredge every two years when funded the Wilmington Harbor Inner Ocean Bar. And, and the town is familiar with that. That material is either placed on Oak Island proper or Ballhead Island. And coming up, we're, going, we're, we're tracking to schedule, uh, advertise, have bid open and award a contract in September this year to be in a position to award a contract, I mean, to start dredging an environmental window. So I got just a, a couple of uh, maps. I just want to kind of orient folks on what we're doing. The purpose of the federal dollars is to dredge the Wimpton Harbor Navigation Channel. So we're getting the speed bumps out of the channel. Um, those Purple magenta colors are the reaches of uh, the Wilmington Harbor project that's beach compatible with sand. We always try to put it as a resource to adjacent beaches. It's least cost for us and it's good for the adjacent community. But the intent of the federal dollars is to get the speed bumps out of the navigation channel. While we're there um, dredging, if there's more material, an opportunity for somebody else to get some more material, we've done that in the past. Um, in 2018, I guess it was, when we last time here at Oak Island, we also executed a memorandum of agreement that allowed us to take non-federal funds to dredge more material from our channel that helps us and put more material on your beach that helps you. So these are just general uh, information. There's between a million and two million yards that are actually in our channel. Uh, we, just like you, when you go to the grocery store, we have to uh, budget for what we can we have to buy what we can afford with our budget. So we're looking to, to dredge somewhere between 700,000 and um, million and a half based on the, how the bids come in. So 
we're planning to put a contract out and dredge with federal dollars. And what I was going to explain to the town, um, this is maybe too complicated, I mean, too, too much detail, not too, com too much detail to see, but this is a plan sheet for my set of plans and specs. This kind of shows where we're planning to dredge, but what I wanted to show in the next picture is the red. So we're dredging, we're dredging, let me see if I can make this work here. We're dredging from here, and we're placing from here going this direction. So we'll start about the property line of the of Fort Castle, go to Castle Beach, and there's an environmental spot we're not allowed to place material, and we start here and go. And our intent is we, we dredge till we run out of sand or we run out of money, and we try to maximize the efficiency of our dollars to get the most sand out of the channel for navigation. So as of today, we're estimating that the red is where we can go with our federal dollars. And talking with the town, um, we would put in our contract an option. So we're going we're gonna to award a contract, pay the mobilization cost, and dredge to pay the, dr the red on our dollar. While we're there cutting our grass, if you'd like us to cut yours while we're there, um, we broke it up into two options. This is roughly um, 300,000 yards, and this is an additional 300,000 yards. If you think about um, this normal dump truck you see going down the road, it's about 10 yards. So a million yards is 100,000 dump trucks. So it's way more efficient to get material on the beach through a, a pipeline dredge or a hopper dredge than it would be to haul it in. Just kind of gives perspective how much, what's a million yards look like. It's a it's a, a hundred thousand dump trucks. So, um, our 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 contract. The question I'm sure that you would ask. We we were we're, we're planning to advertise our contract in July, have bid opening in August. At the bid opening, we would have the prices, and we're going to ex with awardable bids in the contract. We're going to move to exercise and award a contract of our federal cost. At that time. The town would have the actual prices in the contract and be able to say, I'd like to play poker with you, or I would like not to play poker with you. I'd like to, I'd like to participate in this contract, or I'd like to not participate in the contract. So um, we, we have uh, to be able to put this work in as an option of our contract. We need to execute a memorandum of agreement, MOU, memorandum of understanding. Um, you've got a draft letter of intent in front of you that that uh, gives an uh, intent to participate and uh, gives an estimated um, expense of, up, of uh, about $6 million. Doesn't, doesn't hold you to it. Um, allows us to put you in the contract as option and w when the bids come in, if you'd like to participate and execute and we can put the sand further down the beach. If not, that's your call. But I, to me, it's kind of a win-win for both of us. If you do participate, we get more out of our channel um, you get more uh, sand on your beach. Um, I'm trying to think of. We're looking at about, on average, 150 to 200 foot wide beach down the beach. Um, so we we survey the beach uh, based on where the beach uh, surveys are now. We've made estimated quantities. Part of the contract would be when the contract's awarded, the first thing the contract will have to do is resurvey the beach because we can't we, we can dredge between November 16th and April 30th because of turtles. Between time of award and when the contractor mobilizes and starts pumping, the beach does make adjustments like you know. So we would adjust our placement. So um, our goal our goal would be to get the sand out of the channel and get it as far down the beach as money would allow. But I'll, I'll let y'all ask questions if you have any. Um, for us to move forward. We just need the letter of intent if that's what you choose to do. Um, we've got an MOU package that I'll, I didn't bring with me tonight, David. I'll, I'll provide a draft copy. We send that to our division office in Atlanta. It takes about three weeks. They send it back. We give it back to the town to sign, and then our Colonel, Colonel Morgan, executes it. That just puts you, that just says we have agreement to include the green portion of this contract in our contract. Doesn't, doesn't put you as requirement to uh, make a decision or not. <clears throat> we'll give you the budget. We have given you a budget of about $6 million. When the price comes in, 
We'll move to award our contract, send you a request for funds. If that's what you choose to do, then you have, I think, 30 days from our letter to provide the funds. Mayor, a few more things about this. Uh, basically, this is in our big project that we have coming up this year as well. Uh, council a few years back uh, put in a budget process to be able to pay for this. Uh, we assumed a few things then that we would have $3 million going back toward the Wilmington Harbor project. And then you had the $40 million going to the master project. Uh, so the first $3 million that you have that takes you from Norton Street to 71st Street was already in the budget and already sort of approved through the council when they established the sand tax fund 47. Uh, the second part from 71st to 54th, um, we can't find any sand any cheaper uh, than not having to pay mobilization and demobilization through the core. Um, so we would recommend uh, working with Bob and them to extend as far as we can go uh, with whatever sand is available. Um, there'll be some additional surveys right before the project's done uh, to see. Um, we've already had some conversations with the core and Moffitt Nickel about establishing how we're going to tie these things back in and how we're going to bid the project. Uh, so really this is uh, sand that would come first uh, that would actually be part of the master plan going forward. Um, so this is less sand that you would have to account uh, for uh, through another source. Um, council questions. So if I understand you correctly, Mr. Kelly, even though we don't have a precise number at this point, it is unquestionably the case that the core project will produce sand that will be far more economic for us than taking it from 10 miles offshore, right? So that's the basic yes, premise of this. The three million in the budget, if we decide to, pardon the expression, exploit the advantage of the core, um, is there a not to exceed number? Or so are we gonna buy as much sand as the core can give us? Yeah. So basically when we write the memorandum of understanding, the agreement that we have with the core will be a fixed amount. Uh, as Bob was saying, you can either do the um, option A or option B, or a portion of either one. Um, but the dollar amount then and the sand quantities will pretty much be locked into that point. Uh, Catherine had to bring a budget amendment back to you for Fund 47 uh, to move those funds out from that project to the uh, Wilmington Harbor project. Um, but in that, that would come out of the 40 million that you had already allocated for the total so project. We'll be net neutral, is what you're saying. Yes, sir. Because we'll need less sand on the other project if we buy more sand at a cheaper rate. Yes, sir. That sounds like a bargain. And if, it would be great if um, the Corps comes back and says there's even a larger volume uh, than what was anticipated. Um, and then we could come back and I don't know if there'll be a cubic card price then that we could look at. Uh, but they have their own restraints too as far as they can go. Um, but we would, um, as we have before, and working with them back in 2018, uh, the town utilized as much sand as we could honestly get from them. Thank you. That makes sense. Well, I, just, just for just general public information, when the contract's awarded and we get a schedule from the contractor, we'll put on, we'll give a, a link to a GIS, a GIS map that shows based on their forecasted schedule where the contractor plans to be on the beach. The question always is, is while they're dredging, is the beach closed? about 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet where they're actually working, you can't lay out or fish there, that moves down the beach and you can you can do whatever you want to either side of that as they move. Um, but we, we'll give a map that we give a schedule that we update on a regular basis. So if somebody's renting a house or somebody's has a hotel that they want to know, is this going to be, when is this, when is this construction going to be in front of my, my property? They would try to have some information. The other thing that we did in 2018, I thought really worked well, we had weekly meetings included, uh, the towns of Oak Island and towns of Castle Beach, uh, the Corps, the contractor, just to have day, a weekly face-to-face -face discussions on, you know, you know your access points better than anybody. You know your public works team knows how to help with staging areas, those kind of things. So those are, those are the kind of things. We're going to have those types of meetings, that information, whether you exercise your options or not, because you're going to get some sand on our dollar. Any if, other questions, Council? If I may to clarify, first, thank you very much. Uh, that is that is a gift to us as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when you talk about 
delivering the, the sand, that will be pipeline dredging? It, we advertise to be a pipeline dredge or a hopper dredge pump out. Um, it'd be my, if I was guessing, this always has been a, a pipeline dredge has a more, um, is a more efficient tool. That'd mean the hopper pump out couldn't, couldn't work. So we, we try not to restrict competition. That, that drives our prices more than anything. So we advertise as a pipeline dredge or a hopper dredge pump out. Every time we've done this side or the Ballhead Island side so far has been a, a pipeline dredge. And Mr. Kelly, if I may just clarify it for me one more time so, I, so, so I'll know. Our $40 million uh, project that's, that's upcoming, whatever sand we're able to get from, from the core, that just offsets that $40 million obligation. Correct. Uh, again, thank you, sir. We'll, we'll keep you informed as we move forward. I appreciate it. So, uh, just a quick question for David, if I may. So simultaneously with this project will be the balance of the project on the for starting at the point working the way east, possibly? Yeah, so um, once we bid our project, it'll have um, sort of a timetable and be able to see where they start at. They may start on the east and work west. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but tying into the core project, um, there will either be a mound of sand because we'll be putting some of a dune restoration and some berm. Uh, we're Bob and then we're just placing the sand onto the beach, like he said, 150 to 175 feet. Uh, we may ask to narrow it there and see if we can go a little longer in distance. Um, but uh, as far as the east and west, during the bid process, there'll be a little bit more detail. Okay, thank you. We've had examples in the past of two contractors working on the same area, or two kids working playing in the same sandbox, and we've been able to um, work work toward common goods. So I think if that's something that you get a contract awarded, I think I'm not worried about that. You know, somebody having to fight for a beach or access those types of things. Any other questions? Is there a motion? from council to approve uh, consideration of the memorandum of agreement. Yeah, we'll have the, um, we just have the letter of intent tonight. Yes. And we can handle that during old business. We just wanted to make sure Mr. Kiesler had time okay. to present to council. Thank you. Early in the meeting. Thank you. We're, it's a Thank pleasure you, to work with you. Thank you, Bob. Next on the agenda um, is a public hearing for quasi-judicial hearing and extension request for a special use permit at 6963 Kings Ling Drive. Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor, as you indicated, this is a SUP or special use permit uh, extension request. Uh, the applicant is Mr. Gandhi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly of, uh, I believe, Poseidon Palace LLC. It appears that Mr. Grady Richardson will be representing him this evening from the New Hanover County Bar. <clears throat> As a quasi-judicial hearing, the applicant's entitled to a fair and impartial decision-making body. We've gone through this before. I need to ask a few questions of the, the council as a whole. Does anyone have a financial interest in the subject matter of this extension request? Okay. Uh, does anyone have a family or business relationship with the applicant? Has anyone made a site visit to the site for the purposes of assessing this uh, extension request? Okay. Has anyone had any discussions about the substance of this request with staff outside the context of this hearing? Has anyone had any substantive uh, uh, discussions with the applicant or anyone uh, acting on behalf of the applicant about the substance of this application. Okay. Um, I'll let uh, Mr. Kirkland explain the the status of the project, uh, as well as Mr. Richardson. Our code section four point four point eleven deals with the uh, what what triggers the expiration. It's a two year permit. Uh, and if certain things have not been accomplished within that two years, uh, it would expire. And then there are three criteria under which the council considers into determining whether they want to provide an extension. Um, all those who wish to provide testimony must be sworn in and they'll be subject to cross-examination. 
uh, and it will require at least a majority vote to grant the extension. So are there any questions of me before we move forward? All right, any, Ms. Stites, you want to swear everybody in? Yes, sir. You solemnly swear that the evidence you give to counsel during this hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Thank you. That's it? Yep. Okay. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Town Council. Uh, as, uh, Mr. Eads just mentioned this is a quasi-judicial hearing uh, related to a special use permit. Uh, the applicant has requested a one-year extension. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Gandhi, has uh, applied for a one-year extension to a special use permit uh, to allow a dwelling single-family large as classified in our ordinance in the R7 medium density residential district. Uh, the special use permit was originally granted on June 14th, 2022. Uh, here on your screen, you'll see a, a GIS map of the property. Um, the property highlighted in green is the proposed development. There's a little red pin there, kind of a little bit in the middle of the property. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, all the zoning in the area is R7. Uh, you can see underneath some of those layers the, uh, the aerial photography as well, showing the, the condition of the lot. Uh, as Brian mentioned, 4.4.1 uh, of the Unified Development Ordinance deals with uh, extensions of development approvals. Uh, basically, for special use permits, uh, you are uh, allotted a two-year uh, approval. Uh, you can meet certain criteria in order for that permit to remain valid. Uh, basically, if it's a, just for a use, you have to commence that use. Uh, and then if there's development, you have to meet a certain criteria uh, for development, for the total cost of development in order to uh, qualify for that. Uh, in addition, uh, the permit issuing authority in this count case council approves special use permits. So you are the permit issuing authority for special use permits. Uh, you can extend the period for up to one year uh, when it will otherwise expire. Uh, if you conclude that the, these three criteria that Brian just mentioned one, that the permit has not yet expired. Uh, two, that the permit recipient has proceeded with due diligence and in good faith. And that three conditions have not changed so substantially as to warrant a new application. Uh, in addition, uh, should this one year extension be uh, granted, uh, successive extensions can be granted for up to six months uh, for a period not to exceed three years on the same findings. Uh, so that's just a brief introduction. Uh, I'll turn it over to the applicant. I believe we've been hearing both and then questioning after. Would you like questions? Would you like to introduce those that PowerPoint as an exhibit? Sure. How many slides total was that, Mr. Kirkland? Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five slides total. Any objections, Mr. Richardson? No. I will receive that six slides. Is that what you said? Five. Five slides into. Evidence as Exhibit 1 without objection. Um, Mr. Richardson, do you have any cross-examination? Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and members of council. I'm Grady Richardson, and I represent the applicant for this extension request. Um, I believe I'd like to make as additional exhibit, if it's okay, Ms. Reeds, the entirety of the agenda packet is pages 4 through 25, and just identify that entirely as two. two. Okay. Staff, um, no, no objection. Word Matt, go. You don't object, Mr. So we'll receive the agenda packet. Uh, four, did you say four through 25? Yes, sir. As exhibit two, Madam Mayor, without objection. So 
So we're here tonight um, on behalf of Mr. Gandhi and his LLC requesting an additional one year extension. You've gotten somewhat of an overview by way of emails uh, that Mr. Gandhi sent to uh, Ms. Stites, Mr. Kirkland, and Mr. Golden um, on June 5, 2024, that lays out a narrative. Um, Mr. Gandhi's company went through Lyle Architecture, wasn't satisfied with the design, then went through uh, what's called, um, get the name right, Ocean 3 Design, was not satisfied with their conceptual design either. So on uh, December 2nd of last year, uh, Mr. Gandhi hired PB Designs, who came up with the conceptual design March 16th of 2024, which is in the agenda packet exhibit two, uh, that satisfies what his vision is for the home that he wishes to retire in one day. He kind of laid that out as well in his email to council. Following that conceptual design and his approval of that uh, depiction, uh, he's subsequently hired Pakula, Pakula Builders as the general contractor in April of 2024. He also has the surveyor VCS and O uh, that's done survey work. Um, Mr. Gandhi submitted his CAMA application, minor application, May 17th of this year. Um, and there's been some back and forth with the review by CAMA, needing more details shown on the survey, making sure that certain buffer areas, uh, environmentally sensitive areas, are addressed on the survey to the degree and uh, specificity that DCM requires. As late as this afternoon, um, on resubmission to address some details, uh, DCM responded uh, with only one more thing that needs to be shown better. Uh, and I've got the email and I'll, I'll read it into the record. Um, but we're very close, I guess would be the way of saying it. Uh, Mr. Gandhi's very close to having the CAMA permit finalized. He's got his builder and he intends to get this house built and finished uh, within a year or substantially finished by 12 months from now uh, if council will grant the extension. He has paid thousands of dollars for design work to date, survey work to date, legal fees to date. Uh, he has, and I'll, I'll mark this, these as exhibits three and four. Um, we had to get certain specif uh, specific Structural uh, designs done. May I approach? What I'm what I'm marking as Exhibit Three is a shop drawing by Superior Walls. The these are going to be prefabricated concrete, engineered structural engineered walls. Uh, that also requires special doors and windows. We're talking about in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so it takes time to generate these types of drawings uh, as well as getting a budgetary estimate for the windows and doors. And that's what exhibits three and four uh, show you. Exhibit three is from Superior Walls. Exhibit four is from Easy Glass. Mr. Uh, Mr. Richardson, I haven't handed out four yet. Do you, do you want them both to go out now? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kirkland, no objections to these on behalf of staff? I recommend we accept exhibits three and four into evidence without objection. As you'll see on exhibit four, uh, the easy glass estimate alone is for over $400,000 uh, for the um, the windows and doors, uh, and then it includes another hundred thousand dollars or more uh, regarding uh, certain uh, finishes. So I guess going back to the standards here of um, the extension request. Uh, at the time that he requested the extension, the permit had not yet expired. I understand that there was a council meeting originally scheduled for last week, but it's got moved tonight. 
so we satisfy one. Um, they're going to skip to number three, the conditions that were present <coughs> immediately adjacent to this property back in June of 2022 have not changed the surrounding neighborhood. Um, his house is in harmony with the other houses that are at the point already. Uh, and given the layout of money uh, with now three design companies, one of which he's decided upon with uh, PB Designs, as well as the surveyor and the contractor. He's gotten estimates and he's ready to proceed as soon as he gets his CAMA permit. Um, I think he's on his third iteration now with the CAMA folks. Uh, and based on the email today, there's nothing standing in the way of getting the CAMA minor permit other than satisfying the last item, which is the driveway and making sure that the materials and the setback of the, I'm sorry, the materials for the driveway are consistent with the areas of environmental concern and also the decking to the extent it encroaches into the 60 foot uh, buffer uh, satisfies CAMA's requirements for doing so. Uh, those should be shored up relatively quickly. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Gandhi is obviously here. He's happy to answer any questions that council may have. But on behalf of my client, uh, we would ask that the council grant this. And you can see from the evidence that's been tendered, uh, he's proceeded in due diligence and with good faith. Uh, it's taken longer, obviously, to get this off the ground, but he's ready to move forward and, and get it coming out of the ground ASAP. Any questions? Council. I'll again take a first step if I may, please. So, um, question, Mr. Richardson, does this um, house have an elevator? Mr. Gandhi, you need to come over here in case they have questions that are beyond my knowledge. And be sure to speak into the microphone. Sure. Good evening, council members. Good evening. Uh, yeah, there is an elevator. So, question is how, how high is the elevator? Uh, I don't think we are going above the standards of 41 feet. I'm sorry, I don't have the thing, but it's not crossing the 41 feet. It's only two-story building. Okay, so there's no rooftop terrace like the no, Ocean Crest Hotel no with a 54-foot tall elevator. No rooftop terrace. Because that came as a, the, the terrace came as a surprise to council, I think to everybody in the Ocean Crest Hotel. So question is, is there anything hiding here that we should know that if we don't ask the right questions, then we might not be able to get that right answer. The, Any to surprises? my knowledge, there is nothing to hide. I think we have submitted the structural plans. Um, I'm sure town has it. I'm sorry, Mr. Bob. I still don't understand oh, what no, is okay. hiding the fact. I mean, to but, my knowledge, the structural engineer must have laid down everything. What? town would need in an application, I guess. So there is nothing to hide, I mean. Well, the question, I guess, let me put it in context, if I may. So the rooftop terrace of the Ocean Crest Hotel came into play when we asked about it. It was like, what is this here? And there was a discussion that the two of you had that it was, you said it was a rooftop terrace. So our question was, is that gonna be opened as an amenity to the hotel? And the two of you huddled up for about 10 minutes before you came back and said, no, it's not going to be used as an amenity. So there, that's my question. I would say that was a commercial business and a commercial request. This is purely residential. The plans that he's proceeding with, if granted this extension, appear in the packet. They're PB designs. And you can see that there's no terrace uh, on the design whatsoever on the roof. And clearly, if he were doing things that are not... Uh, allowed in a residential zoning district, the town staff would have, and code enforcement would be able to shut that down very quickly. <clears throat> but here's no, we'll go on the record, there's no terrace plan for the top of this house, okay. and it's not going to be used for any sort of commercialization of a residential structure. He, he plans to retire here. He may rent it out some after it's built, but for purely residential purposes and nothing on top of the house. Well, council, uh, to be fair, I would say uh, the applicant has expressed a desire to rent it. And so it's not 
purely a residential structure. It's going to be a rental at some point. Is that not correct? I understand that the use is residential. Can it be rented out? Sure. And that does, te that does satisfy the definition of commerce like many other homes in Oak Island would be rented out. I just want to make sure we're not mischaracterizing. This is not a simple retirement home. This is a home that could be rented for a long period of time depending on when the gentleman decides to retire. And I don't know if he wants to give us a date or not. Do you, sir? I, I didn't think if so. If I win a lottery, I'll give you the date. Okay. So yeah. it's more than a simple residence. That's, that's my only point. Uh, so I wanted to ask if I, one more question, then I'll be quiet. But with respect to the timeline, so I'm trying to understand the timeline. When we, I'll go back again to the Ocean Crest Hotel. We had questions about the architectural features of the hotel. And within 60, maybe it was 90 days, you came back with a whole new set of drawings. So that's a commercial property, a hotel. And a 12-bedroom, 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 12-bath house took two years to come back with drawings that met your expectations, trying to understand that concept. I understand the explanation that Mr. Richardson gave, okay. but two years just seems so amazingly you, excessive. I'm so sorry to interrupt no. you. Go ahead, please. I'll finish. Thank you. So uh, most of the house, what I have built here on this island and other places, uh, you go to the builder and they is one-stop shop. You just go there. They have structural engineers. They have architects. And you know, we, most of the time here, we have done the stick construction. This is the house I wanted to take a little different route. And so I went with the architect. None of the other house I went with the architect. Now, once you went to the architect, they wanted to know what, how we are going to build it. So when I went with the superior walls, not many people can do it. They are the only people who will do, as you can see, that 3D printer, they have done it. So, and they are the one who's going to retain the structural engineer because there's a special way to build it. There are certain homes here, that's where I've got my idea from. And again, if you see about the windows, it's, it's, there has to be a specific way, specific opening that needs to be you know, with those concrete walls. I can't just do anything. You know, it cannot be over the certain heights. So I might have to go back and change the height of the window. So this is not a typical construction which I'm trying, I'm attempting to do. But as you can see, we have started getting an estimate already. And I wasn't aware when I applied for Kama permit that it is, it is expiring, truly speaking. That's why I got a you know, request from the town to apply for the next venture. I simply dropped the ball there. So if, if I'm Mr. Gandhi, uh, David Lyle, as an architect, when did you do that? When did you reach out to this individual? So immediately this after I bought, I was very excited. <laughs> and I said, who is the best architect in this area? And obviously he's out of Wilmington. And he drew this concept design. And I think it was, I have the invoice. Uh, it was 2020. I have the invoice if I wanted to check it out. I think it was a 2020 or 2021. Uh, that was even before it. I wasn't even aware that I would need a special use permit to build 5,000 square feet home. So I did those work even before knowing that I would need the permits. So you passed on his services that were offered in 2021. Yeah. Then because you went it to was Ocean only 3. windows on that. If you see the design, it looks really fancy, but I don't think I can build it. Then you went to Ocean 3 Design. When did you do that? Uh, I think it was after one, one and a half years. I, if you want, I can give you an exact date. Uh, March 15, 2021, I set the contract with them, with Ocean 3. Uh, I'd like to also know about P PB Designs. And that was signed uh, December 2nd, 2023. 2023. Mm -hmm. Another question that I'd love to get the answer to is you contracted with Pecula, is that Pecula Builder. You, right, you contracted with them in April of 24, April 20th, mm -hmm. less than two months before your special use permit would expire. Then you modified and have an agreement in paper here with Superior Walls on June 13th. I haven't modified any paperwork. I mean, well, the paperwork that they gave you, 
at one time was June 3rd, 2024, and then Date, date created, June 3rd, 2024. Date modified, June 13th, 2024. I do not deal with superior walls uh, directly. Everything has to be done through Pakula Builders. Okay, I'm so, just reading what, what, what your side has offered to me. And then I'm gonna also ask you about EZ Glass. That was June 5th of 24. Correct, so they have based on my concept design from PB Design, which I give it to, to Pakula Builders, Ms. Dennis. She sent out to get me an estimate that whether, how can this be built? I haven't contacted any of this directly. They, they are their contractors. They are also the one. Go ahead and finish. No, so I do not deal directly with those sub vendors as of now. So it is a Pakula builder. I haven't even seen the dates until you pointed me out this, but I haven't done any changes or asked him to do any changes there. Mr. Mr. Kraft and Council, if you look at Exhibit 4, you can see the date of the plans that EZ Glass is referencing. Those were from Febu February 17th of 2024. And so it took from that date of those plans to generate Exhibit 4's estimate, which, again, it's not a simple estimate of putting in some windows and doors because of the structural um, components with the concrete walls and... Um, support system so yeah it wasn't just done recently it takes a while to get this sort of estimate and the estimate is pretty pretty sizable but if i may on, based on the plans that have been generated he's hired pakula pakula goes and takes the plans of pb to get what you see in exhibit three for the shop drawings and then the windows and doors through easy glass and when they get it turned around is when he is able to move forward on it. But, but Before think, Councilman Box said, said I, one last thing, if I may. I, well, I want to pursue your point here for a second, if I, with your Go ahead. permission. Go ahead. So this, this, in my mind, goes to standard two and due diligence. So for a year and a half, by your own admission, or almost two years, nothing happened. You were unhappy with the designs. I mean, you knew that you were working with a two-year boundary, right? This is all self-induced. The complexity that you chose took you over the line, and you entered into this process knowing the permit ran for only two years. So that year and a half of back and forth searching, designing, redesign, that, that's something you created. I, I wouldn't deny that fact. Okay. I mean, I, I wish, but sometimes this architect don't come back to you that often. Sometimes it takes three to four months to get the first first pass, you have some limited pass. There are a lot of, when you go with one-stop shop with the builder, it's very fast, it's easy. When you have a strict construction, they know it, what they're looking for. And when you go with this kind of a construction, even the base has to be the concrete. It's, it's I wish I could say that, I don't, I really don't want it to be standing here, you know. I wish I could have pushed this. Uh, but I tried my best as much as to reach this point. I have spent money, I have spent time, I have put the vision to this particular lot, and uh, I'm sorry if you feel I have not given enough to this no, project. I, I'm just trying to appraise the process. Here, I understand, right? and I'm only and So you chose complexity, and you didn't do enough pre-planning to deliver the, the result within the timeline. I mean, you've had other, you're building a hotel. You've had other experience. You know how long this takes. Superior walls, there are only two or three homes in this area. And if you see my previous first two ones, they are all stick construction. That was not planned this way. Yeah, I know. But I understand. I owe that mistake. I, I should have known it. Okay. Well, I appreciate your candor. Just a matter of housekeeping. Mr. Kraft, the, the dates you were referring to earlier, they came off what's been marked as Exhibit 3, and at the title that reads Shop Drawing General Information Page. Bottom right-hand corner, those are the dates you're referring to? Yes, sir. I, I just, I'm we all know what we're saying in here. I just want the minutes to reflect that so it's a cleaner yeah, I, record. I thank you, Mr. Kraft, for the time. I'll give it back to you. Uh, one last question, sir. And I know it's not pleasant to come up here and, and it's not a pleasant situation one last question. 
You reached out to Brady Golden from our. I'm sorry. You reached out to uh, Brady Golden from our planning department, according to your letter. You reached out to Brady, and he told you. No, you he, when I submitted the permit, he emailed me saying that your permit is expiring. You need to renew it. Uh, I did not reach out to him. He reached out to me, and in that process, process I began. Okay. To take that further, then, at no time during the two-year period that we gave that the council gave a spatial use permit. Did you reach out or communicate with the planning board as to your uh, developments or how you were progressing? And then finally, the planning board reached out to you and said, your time's about to expire, and that's what brings you here today. So as I said, you would need a structural and design and survey, updated survey, to, to submit for the comma permit. When that was submitted, that was the time Mr. Brady reached out to me. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gandhi, I have a, a few questions, if I may. I'm continuing uh, questioning on the timeline. I understand um, your drawings from the concept drawings from Lyle were sometime in 2020 or 2021, and I heard you say that you didn't understand at that time you were going to have to go through the special uh, use permit process. But if I look at Oceans 3, and if I look at the date on here, they provided you a conceptual design in September of 2021. Mm -hmm. Further, they provided you a preliminary design in 1223 of 22. I'm, I'm trying to understand how during the conceptual and preliminary process, you didn't yet realize that this house was not designed to what you wanted. It went further to 217.23 before you actually recognize that this was not the design you want. So it seems like you seems like you lost a lot of time there. I can show a lot of back and forth email with my, you know, design. I do not want to wish what went wrong with that Ocean 3 design, actually speaking. But we went half the way even to get an estimate to build that particular house also. But as I said, I don't want to put my personal showing that watch I did not like in that house. And that's why I gave in. I hate to lose money and time both deciding on, on this particular house because this is what I wanted to stay. This is the house or a lot which is, has three-sided water. And I mean, what more heaven I can get, you know, on East Coast. So I wanted to put everything on it. Uh, but you are right. I owe it to that one. that I lost some time in that process. Thank you. May I ask a few questions of Mr. Gandhi for your benefit? Mr. Well, Gandhi, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Grady, or Mr. Richardson. Uh, since we started with council questions, I'd like to see if, I'd like to finish council questions first. Are there any, doesn't mean you can ask them, can't ask any later, but before Mr. Richardson asks additional questions, are there any additional questions from council? About the timeline or just questions? About in anything. I, one more. If, with respect to the, the house that you're building, was the initial intent before you applied for a special use permit to build a house under 4,000 feet or under, or was your intent all along to build a 4,968 square foot home? Yeah. I don't know in the process. I would. Your, your question is that when did I decided to make it to 5,000 square feet? Well, when you started going through the process and talking to architects, you know, were you thinking it was going to be 4,000 square foot home no, or 5,000 square foot home? If, if I recollect right, I always wanted to make, build the largest house possible. Okay. Thank you. I, I just have a couple of questions for clarification. Um, so, to your best of your knowledge, is there any design element that exceeds 41 feet? So the roof is identified um, as something lower than actual structures. I'm trying to find the exact page. There seem to be two structures above what's shown to be the roof line. Page 24. Thank you. On page 24. And 34, I think so. This As far as I see on this page, A201, 
it I think is only 34 feet to the top, the most top portion of the roof. Okay, yeah, but then there are two things on top of that. Good, no, it doesn't so show. It doesn't show how much. The bottom is 31. I'm so sorry. That's I, okay. Let her finish. I'm it just so it doesn't show the two triangular pieces lying on their sides. It doesn't show how tall they are. So it only shows the height to the roof line. I'm so sorry. My apology to interrupt you. That's okay. Uh, if you see on the left side, uh, roof line, it will show 30 feet, 31 foot and 4 inches. Uh -huh. And when you go on the right side, I think I just saw. No. Um, and for the record, he's looking at sheet A201. I am too. Thank okay. you. Okay. Just doesn't show. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. The scene is this elevation. This is only 31 feet. Mm -hmm. So, what is this elevation? This one. Mm -hmm. And I somehow. It's, it's hard to read, so. So That's sorry. okay. No, no, no. It's not your fault. <laughs> Eight but and a half by eleven. But it is below forty-one is... feet. That I'm, I'm very much aware of that. Yeah. No, I just want that assurance. That's all. That yes. we're we're one hundred and ten percent. And is that forty? Do you plan? Is there fill involved in this project? In other words, if you put three feet of fill, is it going to end up being forty-four feet in height? Uh, good question. I am. So far as if I'm aware of it, my neighbor getting home, they are planning uh, to put it at the same level. Uh, the, whatever my neighbor is, Rakish House, I forgot the name, uh, the address. But they are planning to keep it at the same level of my neighbor's house. Well, that doesn't really answer my question. Matt, can you provide any clarification yeah, to surrounding structures? Uh, that, right? Can you restate your question? I believe you asked if he was going to put fill in. Well, if there's fill, does it take it above 41 feet? That's all. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> the, the way our ordinance measures height is from the average finished grade at the four corners of the structure. So if fill would be permitted on the site, we would measure it at that finished grade uh, subject to our fill ordinance at that point. Which allows how much? Uh, without having topo on the adjacent properties and the road, uh, I couldn't state. No, right, but no, it would no. have to be below. I'm thinking about neighbors and stormwater. Mm -hmm. It so, has to be at or below what neighboring properties are. The the, stat, the standard in our ordinance for what fill you're allowed is a foot over the crest of the road or uh, the highest adjacent structure, whichever is less. So if there's if the lot adjacent to it is less than a foot over the crown of the road, you, you match to that highest adjacent piece of property is the most you could fill. So his, his statement about matching the level of the adjacent property uh, would be compliant with our fill ordinance. I just, I'm, I'm concerned about stormwater runoff that has occurred on a number of properties once development occurs Absolutely. adjacent uh, to existing properties. Um, Is there, do you anticipate, I mean, this comes right below the 5,000 foot level. So at any time, do you anticipate closing in anything in a heated and cooled, creating additional heating and cooled space at the ground level, at a deck level? Is there, are there any plans to enclose any additional space that would take you above the 5,000 uh, As heated for and this cooled plan space? So sorry, I have okay. this habit okay. I need to change. No sorry worries. for that. No worries. Uh, as of plan, that it already shows that there is, I think, so 150 uh, feet of heating and cooling. On A201, if you see that the entrance, mm -hmm. it has already been marked there. She, she's asking. So, is there any additional? No other additional spaces which will be added to this for heating or cooling purposes. Okay, that's all, that was all my question is. So I appreciate that. Um, so Matt, I noticed um, on each of the design pages, the very first note says all construction to be in accordance with NC State Building Code current edition. 
So there's no statement that requires him to be within the town of Oak Island building codes. Uh, and, well, he's not, he didn't swear in to speak, but uh, the building code for the state of North Carolina is what the town of Oak Island uses. So there are uh, no, the code. there are no outliers in terms of what's in our code from the state code. Uh, for, for building code purposes, to my knowledge, no ma'am. Okay, that's all I wanted to clarify. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi. Mr. Kirkland, before you sit down, um, I'm looking at sheet A001, which is their um, ground floor site plan. Anything, has anything that's been submitted to the town shown any kind of retaining walls on the property? Uh, not that we've reviewed, no ma'am. Not, not that I'm aware of anyway, no ma'am. Mr. Gandhi, do you have any plans for any retaining walls on this property? Okay. Any other questions, Council? Um, follow up to that one. Mr. Kirkland, if he wanted to put in a retaining wall, what would be our permitting process for that? Sure, you'd uh, get land development permits, fill permits. If a building permit is required, you'd get a building permit at that point as well. Uh, so we, we'd check it for compliance with building code, uh, zoning regulations, as well as our fill requirements for any backfill. Do we allow retaining walls on the beach side? Um, that would be a, a question for Cam, I would assume, as to where you can encroach with a, with a retaining wall as far as the, the setback requirements for that. Um, outside of the, uh, the inlet hazard area or any setbacks for that, um, once again, they just have to meet our local ordinance requirements for retaining walls. Uh, but as far as your question about like, impacts on the beachfront, that, that goes through a CAMA DCM permitting process. Uh, if one's not required, then once again, we just check it for local zoning regulation. Would, uh, would, would Courtney be able to answer that question? She swore in, so if you have CAMA or DCM related questions, okay. yes, I'd, sir. I'd like to if I could. Mm -hmm. um, so retaining walls are not allowed within six feet. Could you go, j just for the minutes, could you identify your name and position with the town? My name is Courtney Milliron. I'm the floodplain administrator in the CAMA LPO for the town. Um, retaining walls are not allowed within 60 feet of the first line of vegetation. Um, according to Mr. Gandhi's surveys, the entire development, the house, the accessory structures with the pool um, are all outside of that 60 foot. Um, the other issue would be, though, um, the entire property is located in the VE flood zone. Um, and retaining walls are typically not allowed um, in those areas without specific studies to make sure that you're not diverting flood waters onto other properties. And what was that zone? Did you say it again? VE. VE. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. If there are no other questions, Council, I'll turn this back to Mr. Eats. Okay. I believe Mr. Richardson had some additional questions he'd like to ask. Yes. Um, so, Mr. Gandhi, um, Councilwoman Kartner uh, noted that the last preliminary plans from Ocean 3 Design was, was submitted to you December 23rd, 2022, roughly six months after you got a special use permit. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you didn't like those plans. Is that correct? Yeah. There was a couple of more designs after that, too. Okay. And in, you're going to make sure you need to speak into this if I'm, we're having to share. Um, with respect to the special use permit, um, has there been any time when you did not intend to build your dream home on the property? No, I always wanted to build it. Okay. Have you expended thousands of dollars in furtherance of building your dream home on the property to date? That's correct. Would you have expended that money if you did not desire in good faith to build the home that the council allowed you to build by way of the special use permit in June of 2022? No. Do you intend to proceed as quickly as possible once the CAMA permit is approved to build this home if allowed with the extension from council? Yes. Would you characterize the 
uh, process of vetting the architectural firms and design work for your home to be due diligence for you. That's correct. And have you proceeded in good faith, Mr. Gandhi, to try and build the home that you would like to live in and to own on this property? Yes. Will you stipulate that no portion of your structure will exceed the 41-foot height limit for your property? That's correct. And will you further stipulate that you will not enclose, after building the house, enclose any other spaces, legally or illegally, with uh, heating and cooling that would put you in excess of that 5,000-square-foot limit? I won't, never. And for... For council's benefit, there is prohibition um, by FEMA and CAMA on enclosing structures on ground floor anyway, especially in these VE zones and ocean hazards areas. Um, you can't pull a permit, and if someone were to do that work, it's not insurable. Uh, it's a problem, honestly, if, if, you're get, if you get caught uh, building and closing something uh, without a permit in the FEMA flood zones. Does council have any other questions for Mr. Gandhi or for me at this time? I apologize if I overlooked it, but how much of an extension is Mr. Gandhi requesting? Uh, the one-year extension? One year. Thank you. Mr. Eads. Um, do you have any cross-examination of staff? I don't. No. Any further questions from council? Anything further from staff? Anything further from the applicant? I would just conclude by saying that, you know, due diligence, um, I think he has shown due diligence. Now, could it have been done quicker? I think he's already told you that in hindsight, he wishes he had known a little bit more about the process. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't involved in the process until recently uh, to come here tonight. But he has proceeded, I think, in good faith. I think no one would lay out this kind of money and go through these steps and go through three firms if they weren't proceeding with due diligence and good faith to build this home. Uh, and he's on the cusp of getting the CAMA minor permit to build the home. Uh, and we would respectfully ask for this one-year extension so that he can start coming up out of ground with the home. With the stipulation in place already of the no 41-foot ex uh, height extension, or violation and also not enclosing in any other space uh, to violate the square footage uh, aspect. Madam Mayor, if I may. Mr. Richardson, I um, believe you or your client acknowledged that the application was submitted prior to the expiration date. And then last week's meeting was canceled. Um, you've, you've just elicited testimony concerning uh, thousands of dollars, I believe that, that's the way you phrase it, that your client spent. Um, Quantify that for you? Well, my question is, that thousand of dollars does not uh, equal 10% of the total cost of all proposed construction, erection, alteration, excavation, demobilization, excuse me, demolition or other similar work authorized? No. No, it does not. So you would, you and your client agree that the criteria for the council to consider tonight are the three criteria you just touched on. One, the permit has not yet expired. Two, the permit recipient has proceeded with due diligence and in good faith. And three, conditions have not changed so substantially as to warrant a new application. Correct. Okay. Madam Mayor, that, those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Rich. And Mr. Condi. We need a motion to close the public hearing. Yes, please. So moved. Second. All in favor. Uh, is there public comment, Mr. Eads? Public comment? Yeah. No, ma'am. All right. So then it's. Oh, but, well, let me just make sure everyone that I saw get sworn in testified. I believe that's all who were sworn in. So since this is quasi-judicial, it would don't. Yes, just making sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, For you is, is is the three is the 
Three criteria. The request for a one-year extension and the three criteria that the applicant acknowledged that's before you right now as to for your consideration as to whether you want to grant the extension. Council, is there discussion? Does anyone care to pose a motion? I'll make the motion to grant a one-year extension on the special use permit for 6963 Kings Lynn Drive. Is there a second? I'll second for purposes of discussion. It's on the floor. And I'm troubled by my definition of due diligence does not meet what happened here. Um, I don't doubt that it's in good faith, but diligence was not done from my point of view. So I would be a no on your motion, Mr. Martin. Well, in terms of due diligence, I find the applicant working in consecutive years with design firms. I personally know from experience trying to remodel a home that finding a structural engineer and working on design took nine months and all I want is a back porch and a front porch. So I believe the applicant when he says there were many iterations and much work went into design and he was consecutively year over year engaging with design firms. So I consider that due diligence. Um, I also want to point out that um, the questions regarding uh, whether or not the applicant plans on exceeding the height limit. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever built a new home in the town of Oak Island, but there are multiple opportunities during construction for inspection. One of those is the building height. And I believe Council Member Cartner had personal experience with building height when she was building her new home. So uh, they would not allow someone to exceed the 41 foot building height. I can tell you that right now. Uh, they would make the, the roof line come back down if they caught that. Um, and then one other comment. I'm not sure, C Councilman um, Chulo, you mentioned 12 bedrooms. I only count 10 in this final design. So I'm, not that it's relevant because we really can't, you can't control or can't ask about bedrooms or how many or how many you can't or what size they are, that's already been ruled on many years ago. And, and so bedrooms are off the table, but I just want to make everyone aware that I'm counting 10, not 12, just in case anybody's I, I, interested. I believe I may have lost track when I was counting them. <laughs> well, building heights not my concern. I, I would say by his own admission, this was self-induced. I mean, this, Unfortunately, this quest to build something perfect led to him overrunning the permit, and he admits that. So I don't see due diligence in that. We, but I think on that point, we can disagree. The building height, I'm confident that he's within the building height. I don't think there's an issue with that. Further discussion, Council? I'm in agreement with Councilman Bach. I, I fail to see the type of due diligence that I would expect expected to see so um, I'm also no on this can we uh, call this to a vote sure do we need to revisit the if, if no one else had anything they wanted to add that's okay account and uh, mayor pro Tembach has asked for a roll call vote okay yes, ma'am okay mayor pro Tembach? no Councilman Kartner? No. Councilman Kraft? No. Councilman Chulo? No. And Councilman Martin? Yes. So just as a point of clarification, what we're saying to the applicant is he would need to submit a new application? Yes, ma'am. Just want to clarify uh, I mean, if, the, if the special use permits expired and not extended, then... I mean, they can do what they want to. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not, they're not mandated to file a new application, but if they want to build what was previously approved, that would be their recourse. Just for point of clarification. So, Mr. Gandhi, I'm sorry, but you're 
uh, request has been denied. Actually, the, the request, the motion to extend has been denied. Has so, been denied, yes. So let me just clarify, would you prefer a, procedurally uh, a motion to deny or are you and your client okay with the fact that the motion to extend has been denied is the same as a denial? I, I would defer to you on that. You're the town yeah. attorney on it, so. It, it, if, can we get a motion? If, if that motion obviously didn't pass, so if there could be a motion to deny the request just so it's a cleaner record. Ms. Stites, do you want to weigh in on that? Because I think we had this issue a few years back. Um, I, I don't think there's any harm in an additional motion. I make a motion to deny the one-year extension of the special use permit to allow a dwelling single-family large at 6963 Kingsland Drive. Second. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to presentations, proclamations, and recognitions. Uh, is Mr. Merrill in the room? Mr. Merrill represents Blue Ridge Mountain Drones this evening and is Vice President Greg Bland with you? Uh, VP Bland did not come with me. Um, I am the Director of Fire and Rescue and Law Enforcement Education at Brunswick Community College and VP Bland is over continuing education and workforce development, but he got called away to another school for a uh, conference, so I am by myself. Um, I'm also a commissioner for the town of Belleville, so I appreciate the last minute addition onto the agenda that you extended to me. So Madam Mayor and council and staff, thank you for helping me and working with me. Um, as you said today, I am here to represent Blue Ridge Mountain Drones. They reached out to me as a vendor that we work with on a regular basis for delivering drone training and education. <clears throat> and if I could, if I could call Chief Lee Price and Sean Barry from the drone unit up here with me. <clears throat> and I will read you the letter that was sent to me by Blue Ridge Mountain Drones that they want to read with this. Um, <clears throat> it says, I am writing to extend my heartfelt congratulations to you and the entire Oak Island Fire Department drone team for the remarkable rescue operations conducted recently. <clears throat> Hearing of the successful deployment of a drone and saving a life is truly inspiring and commendable. Your quick thinking, initiative, approach, <clears throat> and dedication to saving lives are evident in the remarkable achievement. Utilizing technology like drones and emergency situations demonstrates the forward thinking and adaptability of the Oak Island Fire Department. It is a testament to your commitment to leverage every resource available to ensure the safety and well-being of the community. The successful outcome of this operation <clears throat> not only highlights the effectiveness of your team's training and expertise, but also serves as a beacon of hope and reassurance for the community, the state, and across the nation. <clears throat> your, team your team's tireless efforts exemplify the highest standards of professionalism and service. On behalf of Blue Ridge Mountain Drones, we want to express our deepest gratitude for your unwavering commitment to protecting and serving the community. Your actions undoubtedly make a significant difference in the lives of those you serve, and they do not go unnoticed. Enclosed, you will find a check to be used towards your, your drone program. And once again, congratulations to you and the entire Oak Island Fire Department on the extraordinary accomplishments. May you continue to inspire others with your selflessness and dedication and courage. And that was signed by Wayne Bailey, the chief uh, pilot for Blue Ridge Mountain Drones and also the owner of the company. So we have a plaque to present you. And this is for, sorry, I'm gonna have to break out the glasses. For this, one. <laughs> uh, this is for the um, life-saving efforts that took place on May 16th, 2024, when the PFD was dropped from the drone near the uh, pier on Oak Island. So 
Here is the flat and a check to go to the drone program. Thank you, Ron. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was very unexpected. Mayor, if I can have just one quick Please. second. Um, we really appreciate it. And this program has taken off and we've done a lot of training with it. Uh, I want to thank Sean. He has done such a great job putting programs together, training us, and just his piloting abilities with that drone is phenomenal. Um, we, we appreciate Blue Mountain Drones for this. Ryan, thank you for your uh, support. We'd like to thank the citizens especially for the support of these programs and everything that we're doing at the firehouse and especially council, mayor, manager, everybody that is supporting us in this. It does make a difference. We are doing our best to save the lives. Um, with your support, we will continue to strive for that and we just really appreciate it and thanks again. So. Mr. Merrill, thank you for coming to present that. We appreciate you. Next on the agenda is a presentation about the 25th anniversary activities. So uh, while Mike is bringing up those slides, I don't know if everyone is aware, but July 1st marks Oak Island's birthday. And if you're counting, uh, this is our 25th anniversary. So the working with staff and council, we have devised a months long programs of events in celebration of our anniversary. And I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what some of those events are and some of the plans that uh, staff and council have been working diligently on to celebrate this day. So uh, chartered, Oak Island was chartered on July 1st of 1999. We were Yaupon Beach and Long Beach came together to form the town of Oak Island on that day when our charter uh, was passed by the General Assembly. Mike, thank you. So sorry that this is a little difficult to read, but this will be well published. You'll see this in uh, social media as well as on our webpage. So the events for celebrating our anniversary will begin on July 1st and will extend through December. So the uh, July 1st program uh, will begin with a birthday celebration at 5.30 and then uh, extend through the um, um, concert that, concerts, I should say, that followed. And then, of course, a uh, fireworks program. Um, on the July 4th, we will have a parade celebrating our anniversary in the uh, Southport uh, 4th of July parade. In August, we will have a Dutchman dinghy dash, which uh, we've done every year now. So this will be special uh, one in celebration of the anniversary in September. Our business uh, committee is sponsoring a medallion hunt, and details of that program will come. In October, there will be a fire truck pull. Uh, in November, a disc golf tournament. And in December, we will then have the parade, I mean the float, in the Christmas by the Sea parade. Mike? So if you note on the beach day event calendar, down in the bottom right corner from 5.30 to 6 is our Oak Island birthday party celebration. We invite you all to come to Middleton Park and be a part of that uh, celebration with us. And of course, that will also open the 4th of July weekend uh, with opening remarks uh, by the committee chair. And then of course, uh, we will have the national anthem uh, along with an honor guard, uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the concert will begin after that. Mike? So there are a couple of things that you'll notice in the coming days. 
The first is light pole banners, and if you would help me out, Bob. So this is the light pole banner that you'll see along Oak Island Drive, and these will be up until the time when we uh, take these down and put up our Christmas tree lights. So we will celebrate uh, our anniversary through December at that point of time. Thank you. So I think these are very well done. We thank the artist, Candace Lee, for putting that together for us. Mike? There will also be commemorative t-shirts. So you see the back on the left and the front with the anniversary logo. Those will be available on the July 1st and at multiple uh, events along uh, the year, and they'll be for sale until they're gone. And then the last are the challenge coins. So on the left, you see on one side is our seal with the day that we were chartered. On the right side, if you go down to the bottom, uh, is the 25th anniversary logo, and the part that is gray is actually a 3D carving that will appear um, as opposed to the color version that's above it. Um, so we're anticipating also that those will be available for the first and um, will uh, be available until they're gone. So that really sum summarizes our events. We look forward to celebrating uh, our anniversary. It's a very special time uh, to have our silver anniversary upon us. Um, and it's a, uh, an opportunity for the community to come together and celebrate who we are. Thank you very much, Mike. So for the fire truck, Paul, um, in discussions with my fellow councilmen, um, we're going to have a special event, and we're going to call it Jeopardy, <laughs> um, because the fire truck pull is just not in our um, wheelhouse. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next on the agenda is a very special presentation. It's a resolution of appreciation for our town manager, David Kelly, upon his retirement. And if I may read this to you. Whereas town manager David Kelly is retiring from the town of Oak Island, having served the town faithfully for more than 30 years, and whereas Mr. Kelly began his career with Oak Island in 1992 with the former town of Yaupon Beach, and whereas as town manager for Oak Island, Mr. Kelly led the town through hurricane recovery multiple times, worked hard to ensure the town's financial stability, and steered the town through physical growth of the town and the growth of the staff uh, along with that. <laughs> and whereas Mr. Kelly supervised completion of many important projects, including rebuilding the Oak Island Pier and the skate park, hurricane cleanup, and beach nourishment, Enhancements to the Middleton Park Annex, implementing new events such as the Live and Local Concert Series, and many more. And whereas Mr. Kelly has earned the respect of his employees by being a firm yet fair manager, willing to make difficult decisions when necessary, but serving as an advocate for employees when needed. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Oak Island greatly appreciates the efforts of David Kelly as town manager and wishes him all the best in his retirement which he has more than earned. And this is adopted this the 18th day of June, 2024. And Mr. Kelly, we have a printed version of the resolution that we'd like to present to you that all council members have signed. But don't go anywhere. <laughs> so um, on this occasion, I'm reminded of a phrase attributed to Isaac Newton if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So I imagine a point in our future where as we move through this next decade that we will look back and recognize that our accomplishments were made possible because of your efforts, David. And if I may ask the board and the council and Catherine to join me in front of the dais, we have another very special presentation to give you. Where's that? Here. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, but I'm going to cheat on this match. Yep, that way. That's how. So, Mr. Kelly, in service of your diligent efforts to move Oak Island forward in a symbol of our gratitude, we want to award you the first key to the town of Oak Island, an honor that dates back to medieval times, uh, bestowed on trusted friends uh, when given access to a walled city to freely come and go. Uh, so we consider you a trusted friend, and we'd like for you to receive the first key to the town of Oak Island. I also want to let everyone know that we've applied for the Governor's Prestigious Order of the Longleaf Pine. Uh, we were hoping that we would get that by tonight, but um, it did not come through as of yet. But based on Mr. Kelly's years of service and achievements, we're confident that it's forthcoming, which will give us an opportunity to invite you back so that we can award the Order of the Longleaf Pine. So thank you for all you've done. The Council, myself, very much appreciate all that you've done for us. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I just have a few little small things to say because I sort of came in here uh, quietly and going out quietly. Uh, thanks to council for this recognition. Uh, it has been an honor and a privilege working for the different mayors, council, and managers over the last 32 years. Uh, we've accomplished a lot of things. Over the last seven and a half years, paid off major debt. Uh, one of us we're sitting in. Uh, rebuild our pier, three different sand projects, veterans parks, splash pad, flagship, playground, skate park, and we also implemented paid parking. Some like that and some don't, but we did that uh, just to name a few. Uh, we weathered two hurricanes, a tropical storm, and a pandemic while we were going through all these things. I want to thank all the department heads and our dedicated staff for their continued hard work and support over the years. We have built more than just a team. We have created a family. Sorry. Um, whew, I didn't know it was going to be this bad. <laughs> I want to say thank you to my family. Uh, who supported me over the last 32 years. My wife Nancy and son David and Zach. Uh, they've always been here for me. I wish the town nothing but the best moving forward. Uh, my mother was the first co-mayor of the town of Oak Island. And I believe I've helped carry it to the 25-year-old threshold. Uh, before she passed, she had said that she always would carry a part of Oak Island in her heart. Uh, she loved this town, and I will as well. So thank you. going to take a 10 minute break and we'll reconvene at 7:40. We are back from break and um, I want to welcome Catherine Adams, our interim town manager who's joined us at the dais. Thank you. Next on the agenda is adjustment or approval of the agenda. Are there adjustments? Madam Mayor, I'd like to ask for council's consideration to move uh, under new business item V3, V4, and V5 up to, um, to be heard just after public comment. 
Anyone opposed to that adjustment? No. Do I have a motion to approve? Um, I'm sorry, I do have one minor adjustment. Please. Um, on the minutes for April 16th, yes. um, I noted that Attorney Eads was here and he was not. Um, and I should have noted that um, Assistant Town Manager Catherine Adams was here and did not. So I just need to switch those two things. Okay. Okay. And we don't look anything alike. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as adjusted? So moved. Is there a second? second? Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. So we move to public comment. Just remind those who are speaking that we try to keep comments to three minutes. And um, please be respectful of the audience and of council. Uh, Lisa, who do we have? First we have Lisa Bradley. Andy Spradley, 114 Southeast 6th Street, here for Oak Island Beach Preservation. Good evening, Council, Madam Mayor. It's waiting. Uh, there it is. One of the objections or objectives of Oak Island Beach Preservation is to promote education. Each year we award scholarships to graduating seniors from Brunswick County who submit an essay outlining their future educational aspirations. The following individuals are this year's scholarship recipients. First, Addison Justice, who will be pursuing a degree in biology at East Carolina University. Pierce, who will be studying biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And David Utz, who will also be enrolling at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hills, again studying biology. So we want to extend our best wishes to these promising young individuals as they embark on their future endeavors. In addition, <laughs> we have initiated our flash sweeps for this year. Does everybody know what a flash sweep is? What we do is we put out on Facebook and our website, we have a time, a date, and an access point. And we get volunteers to show up. I give you five minutes to go out on the beach and pick up trash. Just take a look at what we were able to get in five minutes. It doesn't take long to help clean it up. So we record and document the items we collect these results are shared on our Facebook page, on our website. And we'd like to invite you to come and witness what you can do in five minutes with me. Our next one will be June 28th, 8.15 in the morning, at the West 54th Access Point. Just look for my signs that say Flash Sweep and look for the guy running around with a weird hat. That's me. I'll give you gloves, I'll give you bags, I'll show you how to do it, and we'll take care of cleaning the beach in five minutes. Also, I'd like to extend an invitation to everyone. This group is a group of volunteers, and we do a lot of things. We had our auction, we do the flash sweeps, we get our scholarships together, and a bunch of other things I'm not going to cover here. But we would love to have more people take part and be a part of our group. And you can be a volunteer, you can even volunteer to be on our board, which is really exciting. We have meetings too. <laughs> but we would love to have some more people. So if you're interested, please go on our Facebook page, on our web page, or you can just holler at me because I'll be here for a little bit longer. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Mark Dolak. you do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mark Dolak. Um, Mark Dolak, 123 Northeast 71st Street, Madam Mayor, Council. Um, as I know, most of you guys are dog lovers. Bob, you got your dogs. Bill, you got your two pups. Mayor, Terry, you guys are dog lovers. Um, one thing I think our town is failing at is dog safety. Uh, nowhere on our website, 
we discussed dog safety, we'd have the rules regulations, but how many times, what was it, Saturday, 92 degrees, uh, you see people walking their dogs in the middle of the day and you're like, hmm, that poor dog, you know? Um, so I think we need to discuss, like, not discuss and educate tourists on, hey, when you bring your dogs to the beach, you should have water and shade. We have the, you know, the beach patrol, we have the fire department, we have the police department. They're going up and down the beach. If they see a person with a dog, say, hey, do you have water? Do you have shade? Um, and I think it's just something we need to bring to the minds. We have local businesses. Last year, I think Century 21 had a sign that said heat index, leave your dogs at home or leave your dogs in the AC. We have those orange signs on the beach. People know, no bumper, no parking already. It's a matter of fact, you know, it's all over the accesses, people know paid parking. Maybe we put, if it's hot on their feet, it's hot, if it's hot on your feet, it's hot on theirs. Um, just educate, educate the tourists, educate the citizens here. When it's, the sand is, when it's 86 degrees, the sand can get up to 120 degrees. Um, asphalt, I saw people this past weekend, walking their dog, going across the dune, walking down our freshly paved street, you know, thank you for that, we love them. But they're walking in the middle of the street and the dog's struggling. And you're like, come on guys, look down, you know? Then they're going to the beach, they're crossing the dune. They're running across the dune because it's hot on their feet, but their dog's in tow. Um, we have Facebook, we have our social media, we have our website. Just, we need to start educating. And that's something we, I think is very important as a dog friendly town, we, we love it. I walk my dogs on the beach twice a day in the early morning or late at night because it's hot, it's summertime. So we gotta continue being dog friendly, a dog friendly town. We have so much for our pups, but we just need to educate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Millard, 110 Southeast 10th Street. Madam Mayor and Council, I'd like to share a quick quiz. Four questions, answer them to yourselves, and then we'll give the answers at the end. Number one, I'm headed to the Friday night concert at Middleton Park, and I want to avoid parking hassles by riding my Rad Rover electric bike. Can I ride it on the sidewalk to avoid getting hit by heavy traffic on Oak Island Drive? Question two. I'm headed to Crossroads Gathering Place for trivia on Thursday evening. And yes, they have changed it to Thursday evening to avoid competing with the Friday night concert on the park. I'm driving down Oak Island Drive and get behind a golf cart traveling 25 miles an hour in the 45 mile an hour section, which of course is illegal on that driver's part. Can I pull into the center turn lane and pass the person? Number three. I am building a new house on Northeast 79th Street overlooking the wetlands. An 18 inch DBH live oak tree is in the center of the rear setback and impairs my view. Can I cut it down? Last of all, is there a place I can easily find an answer to the previous three questions? <laughs> answer to all four questions is no. But within the first six months of this year, e-bikes have regularly ridden on the sidewalk, which is against Oak Island law, our rules. Countless cars have used the center lane to pass golf carts, including the time I saw a school bus do it with children on board. John, you know, I, when I was teaching high school, I had to get a school bus license for field trips, and I know how rough that is. I, I was putting a license in jeopardy to do that because it's illegal. And heritage trees have been cut down. Why does this happen? It's not because that Oak Island is populated by a bunch of law-breaking hooligans. I think it happens far more often because people don't know and don't have a good way to learn. Tonight, you'll discuss how things are going with the recent revision of Chapter 32, the vegetation, or especially in relationship to trees. I encourage you to give ample attention to effective communication and education, rather than focusing only on the level and quality of enforcement. I believe that communication is an area that merits a great deal of improvement in our community. And I believe good, uh, good communication could go a long way in helping to improve many of the problems we face. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Bill Dudley. I'd left five minutes early, I could have gone first, and I had to follow Bill Miller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Phil Dudley, 218 Seller Street, and president of Tree Peace OKI. I spent as little time as possible on social media, but people were aware of Tree Peace OKI's efforts to save and plant back trees on Oak Island, bring things to my attention, and there seems to be a lot of confusion and misinformation on the updated UDO Chapter 32. Going to the town's website, this public confusion is understandable. There is no highly visible announcement about the new ordinance. Once one does manage to find the revised ordinance, they must try to comprehend 15 pages of requirements which make up the new ordinance. For the average property owner, that is a daunting task, especially when 14 of those 15 pages have little to do with a property owner who is not planning to develop their property, but simply wants to know if they're allowed to cut a tree on their front yard. Three months after you approve the new ordinance, it appears that town staff has made very little progress in their education effort. I'm here tonight to ask you to encourage staff to develop and implement a strategy to better educate the public on the issue. And here are a few thoughts on the strategy. I just want to stress, I'm talking about somebody not planning to develop their property. I think an effort has been made with the builders. The town should create a summary of the new requirements that is easy to read and understand, consider creating both a video and a written document. We should heighten visibility of the new ordinance on the town's website. We could send out a copy as a community service um, with, with the water bill, with the utility bill. We could post it on the public, as a public service announcement on social media pages. And uh, we can include it certainly in the current. What we'd like need to see is a definition of a heritage tree, explain DBH, clearly explain, explain that on any developed lot, no heritage tree can be removed from anywhere on the lot without a permit from the town. Talking about heritage trees. Explain that the permit process requires an application and a site plan. And also introduce a tree program manager. So why trees? Trees are a natural stormwater removal engine. Trees are a windbreak. They protect our roofs. Trees shade our homes and our streets. Trees improve the quality of life here, and they increase our home values. Thank you all for your service to Oak Island. Thank you. Nancy McMurray. Hi, I'm Nancy McMurray, 6607 West Beach Drive, and I want to revoice my opinion about the large houses that are being built on the island. Um, we currently have a house that's just under 4,000 square feet building being built next to us. It has 11 bedrooms, it has 11 bathrooms, and it has no closets in any of the bedrooms. We know this is a business, and we know that this is going to rent to 30 and to 35 people. There's parking limitations that are specified um, when they submit their plans. They are authorized to have 25% of the parking spots allocated for compact cars versus the full-size cars that most people bring when they come to the beach. I found that um, our planning department allows the parking for compact cars to be rounded up. The house next to us should have had 3.25 compact cars. And I'm thinking in my math class in elementary school, we learned at 3.5, you round up. If it's lower, you ground down. Well, our planning department allows that to be four spots for compact cars. This is gonna result in a very difficult traffic situation. The cars will not be able to fit into the spots that they've uh, placed. And so I do want you to consider when you're talking about the um, restricting the, pre the size of houses to 3,500 square feet or less, that's a beginning. Because we live in a neighborhood and we have neighbors. And this is really going to be a big imposition. So I hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Stewart.
Evening, Council. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, to start off, I am quicker to criticize than I am to compliment. So this is very important. The police force here has made drastic improvements, phenomenal improvements. They are no longer, in my mind, giving as many warnings. They're giving more citations. They are taking into account what we as residents are concerned about. And I really want to appreciate that. It comes from the top down, but again, those people that are out there, those men and women, those uh, officers, without them, they would, they're making the top look good. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you and that they really do the best that they can. And they do, they, they personally have contacted me to explain situations um, and explain the good, the bad, and the ugly. But uh, I just wanted to say thank you to them. And I think we need to give them a little bit more credit than what we are, because I hear all the time that we're giving warnings and we're not giving citations. No, I saw where they were giving citations. So I wanted to say thank you to them. Bob Green. Honorable Mayor, Town Council, my fellow residents, it's a pleasure talking to you today. I'll be brief and to the point. We are advertising for or in search for a town manager. And I understand the process, but I'm perplexed. You have a truly proven commodity in the position right now. She is the director of finance, was the assistant town manager, and now I gather she's acting as the town manager. She has credentials that exceed anything I've seen. She understands the need and the complexities of our sand problem, which you know is monumental. She has an phenomenal understanding and working knowledge and proven ability to work with the state, the feds, and the county. I don't care if she's a nice person or not. <laughs> she knows how to do the job. She's a proven commodity. My concern for all of you is that you look at a resume because we've all been in that position, they look great, but you don't know how good they are. The current ap applicant, applicant or no, she's not an applicant, the current position holder has an extensive knowledge of this island because she lives here and has lived here. She was the former director of finance over in Caswell Beach. You were smart enough, ladies and gentlemen, to hire as your director of finance. And she helped you, very commendably, bring about a zero tax increase. God bless you, okay? Now I've lived here four years and on my block and the next block, eight houses have come. That's not gonna stop and God bless. That's their piece of America. But you now also, and to your credit, credit, see the need to start developing comprehensive systems, such as if someone complains to the highway department, which does a great job, as does the police and fire department, okay, the park department. I, I got to commend you. Phenomenal. But you need, you're the first to sit there and say, we've got to get to the system or place and put, we have reached the point where we have to put in place systems where everyone is accountable. So if I make a complaint to the Parks Department, every one of you should know. And every one of you should know what the response was, and I should be getting that response, correct? Not just sitting there going, what the hell happened? You realize, and, and I give you credit, because I have a lot of faith in you, my time's up, that this town is not a little 
beach down anymore. It's growing and growing and growing. And if you don't put the pieces in place, and personnel is key, and your current occupant is the right person for that position. She knows it, she lives here, she is. I hope to God that you have the time to sit there and make at least make an offer somewhere along the line to her. Because contrary to what I've heard out there, no offer has ever been made to her. Are you even considering her for the position? Yeah. Enough said, thank you. I appreciate you and you're doing a great job. Okay, God bless you. That's all that signed up. You have a motion to close public comment. No. Not needed. Excellent. Uh, moving on to council reports. John, do we want to start with you? So, Mayor, if I oh, may, go ahead. we were going to oh, introduce thank you for that the, the new business items. Yes, thank you. John, kicking that off. I think it's open for discussion. I, I do intend to offer a motion, but I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say. So just to reiterate, this is uh, 5.3, 5.4, and 5.5 under new business. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. C correct. To bring um, that forward at this time. So is, will Mr. Kirk Kirkland present these or? Well. That's still here? I'll, I'll be glad to make the motion. Okay. I don't see Mr. Kirkwood in the... You do have some of the applicants no. in the hands. Here's what you can, I believe. Yeah. So I would ask uh, council to consider this. Um, it is evident to me after seven years of service that the right-of-way is inherently problematic, especially in terms of enforcing it, in terms of prior deviations, in terms of new issues that constantly come up. And we're seeing... a a parade of encroachment requests. But I think what we really need to do is take a step back and undertake a systematic, thoughtful review of the right-of-way ordinances and look at our enforcement strategies and our, our approach to encroachment. So I would suggest we do the following. We, we undertake that administrative slash council policy approach to this and what I would say to the applicants is um, the three applicants tonight, their approachment applications are tabled until we complete the review. All violation notices would be held, all fines would be stayed uh, until we get a comprehensive plan. And I would also suggest we adopt the moratorium on future um, encroachment requests until we get a study and a plan with respect. So. Um, I fear if we don't do that, this is going to continue to be whipsawing back and forth. And um, I would ask my colleagues to consider that motion. The three parts. It, it, is that a motion? Yes, it is, ma'am. I'll second the motion for purposes of discussion. All in favor? Well, okay, no discussion. We're all in favor. Okay. <laughs> Council? So the motion passes then? Yes. I just want to clarify, Council, the, the wording of that motion, which includes a moratorium, legally correct? Appropriate? I mean, in the general, I mean, moratorium has a, a unique definition um, with respect to moratorium on development, and that's certain statutory criteria and a procedure you have to follow. This is not development. This is essentially moratorium on processing, as I understood the motion. Correct. Request for permission to encroach into the right of way. Correct. Which for they it. don't have otherwise have a right to do. So I think we're okay using moratoria okay. in this sense. I'm using it in very much the conventional sense of the word right. for a limited period of time. Right. Okay. Right. This is not a situation where it's a moratorium on sewer hookups or new construction. It's something that the people that are applying for the encroachment agreement don't have the right to do in the first place. That's why they're making the application. So, correct. And I'm and I overkill on that. I just want to make it clear for I, the minutes. I just wanted to be sure. Thank you, Council. And I would also add this, although it's, I think it's obvious that 
right away enforcement, um, our prior priorities have been identified, safety and denial of public access. That'll continue as well as other egregious violations. We're talking about encroachment applications. That's the limitation on this. So I want to apologize. I prematurely called for a vote. Um, so can we back this up and allow any discussion to take place? Um, well, I think at this point you'd have to have another motion because that motion passed Best. unanimously. Um, Is there a discussion can, to be had? Is everyone good? I think we all have okay. thoughts and we'd like to share them, but we don't have to tonight. We good? Mm -hmm. I could hear. Thank you. You're very gracious. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for moving that up. I'm not saying here. Council reports. Right. I'm happy to start, Madam Mayor. Um, I thought we were going to. I thought the request was to hear five, three, four, and five now. Or did I miss? Right. He made a motion to table them. Oh, sorry. Include all three. Uh, three, four, five. Waiving fines, hold, holding violation letters, and a moratorium on future requests. That's that motion passed. So that that was for all three. Okay. Yes. Thank yes. you. Well, I said that yeah. three points. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I missed it. All right, so um, very quickly, as we have a tendency to have long meetings, uh, Madam Mayor, I want to kudos to you and to your committee for organizing the 25th anniversary celebration. Thank you for taking that on and leading that. Um, I would say if he were here to Mr. Kelly and if this were something other than just actually water, um, I have an Irish toast uh, for him. Uh, May you find fair winds and a following sea sail forth. But I'll do, deliver that in person. This really is water, believe me. <laughs> You're? OK. Um, given the length of our or perceived length of our meeting, I'll be brief. Um, earlier this spring, I think we may have talked about this, the town received a huge uh, grant to um, support our work with our dune infiltration system and just uh, yesterday I believe council was made aware of another large grant and I don't want to steal the manager's thunder because she may be preparing to talk about this but I just want to say that um, congratulations and thanks to our um, to our staff and leadership for going after this money it makes a big difference you want to give the number I don't know if you were going to report on it or not it's fine, $440,000. There you go. Yes, yeah, so in the spring, we received $579,500 with a grant, and then just this week, we received from uh, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality $440,000. So uh, that's, that's something to be very proud of. Thank you. Uh, I get to say it since it's June, and it just happened in June. Uh, one more shout out to the South Brunswick Lady Cougars for winning the state championship. I, uh, it's, they did it in June, and I get to say it in June. Uh, went to a lot of meetings in the last month or so. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers, Moffat Nichols, uh, interim town manager. Councilman Chilo and I, and I'm sure he'll talk about it also, had a meeting with the citizens, and 60 people showed up. Uh, a lot of people talked. A lot of people gave exchanges. And uh, I think it was time very well spent. So I, I wanted to say that. Uh, likewise with uh, David Kelly, I want to point out, uh, we all call this town paradise. He, he's been the engineer of the train. The train has been going down the track quite well. So uh, thank you, David Kelly, for a job well done. Lastly, uh, council members, fellow council members, two people come up to me in the last week and asked me if I would call to your all's attention uh, a lady for a tree to seal uh, award. So I'd like to ask you all to be thinking if you all know anyone or if your friends know of anyone, it might be time to start kicking that idea around again. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Bob? So <clears throat> let me follow up on top of uh, Councilman Kraft there. So we had 60s, 70s, it was, a, it was a great turnout. And thank you to Michael Emery for giving it a name. 
as opposed to um, just an open conversation. It's called Conversations with Council Discussion Series. So this is the first of what we expect, hope to, it's gonna be repeated on a quarterly basis. So come, ask questions, and the best part about it is you get answers. Um, so it feels great to get up here at the podium for three minutes, but then when you sit down, you kind of go, that didn't feel so good, because all you did was talk. So next one, when we do have it, when they announce it, um, please come, ask questions, we'll give you some answers, and when we can't give you answers, we're just gonna write them down and we'll, and we'll get answers for you. So kudos to everybody who was there. To Bill, thank you for co-hosting that with me and looking forward to um, establishing a new tradition here in Oak Island. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, so Cape Fear RPO met uh, last Friday. Uh, it was our kickoff meeting for prioritizing NC DOT projects. I'm happy to announce we did receive uh, scores back from NC DOT and all of the Oak Island projects were scored. So that's that's a good step in the right direction. Would I have liked to have seen the scores higher? Well, sure. I mean, uh, anytime you can move up the list, it's a great opportunity, but we'll take what we can get for now. Um, so now there'll be some work to do some comparisons with the scores and how they compare, because some of our scores fall into the bicycle pedestrian category, which is actually a good thing, because that category we actually could gain some uh, points, if you want to call them that, in that category for our projects, like the bike lane on Beach Drive uh, and the Greenway. All of those are, they'll get uh, an improved uh, analysis because they'll fall into a different category. Uh, so hopefully I can bring back uh, maybe next month a more thorough analysis of where we landed with some of our scores and, and hopefully give an update on where we might be heading with some of those. But. I'm excited. So, although now we just kicked off the prioritization work, it's going to be a lot of work. It takes a lot of hours, but it's well worth it to to help provide input to Brunswick County Transportation Plan. Thank you, Mark, for serving on that committee, and um, thank you to uh, Councilman Kraft and Chulo for hosting the first uh, conversations with Council. Um, I believe we've tentatively schedule the next one for September 17th and Councilman Kartner and myself will host that one so we hope you'll put that on your calendar um, and uh, thank you for the kudos for the 25th anniversary Mr. Bach um, the uh, credit really goes to the staff who have been absolutely remarkable uh, and have uh, worked diligently in these last uh, four weeks to bring things together um, and I'm very much looking forward to a great celebration from the months on the first and for the months ahead. Um, like uh, Councilman Kraft, I myself have been to a number of meetings. Um, the ones uh, that uh, are top of mind for me are those involving uh, hurricane preparedness response and recovery for the county and for the town. Um, I've been to two county meetings. One was for uh, staff, uh, municipal staff and elected officials. The second one was targeted more for elected officials. As the town is preparing for, uh, also the town has had its first round table discussion and uh, there will be more meetings ahead to make sure that we are prepared. But I also just want to uh, remind everyone that they should be making your own plans about uh, emergency, and now is the time to do that, not at the moment that um, a storm is on its way and we're making difficult decisions about how to uh, respond for that. Um, also, uh, along those lines, if you know of any of our residents uh, and or homeowners who would fall in the category of what the county considers special needs. So they would need additional assistance to um, be safe in a disaster. I encourage them to register with the county. They have uh, uh, an access and functional needs coordinator in Billy Howard, 
and uh, this individual will actually meet to make sure that individuals are become part of the registry and they will check with them to make sure of what their needs may be, what uh, assistance they need, may need, um, both pre-storm and to make sure that if a shelter is necessary, they can get them to a shelter where those needs would be met. And if they decide to, to uh, uh, shelter in place, they make sure that they call everyone post-storm and to make sure that, that uh, they weathered the storm well. So if you would help um, us to get that word out to our residents, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, I'll save the rest for a future meeting. So with that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. There are seven council minutes listed in the consent agenda. Um, Lisa, you had mentioned two adjustments. Yes, just on the April 16th minutes. So I'll move the consent agenda as amended. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Thank you very much. It's unanimous. Consideration of an RFQ for physical infrastructure assessment for parking. Mr. Chulo, do you want to give an overview of that? Um, sure. So we had previously. That was, sorry, oh, that was approved that's consent, on the consent agenda. agenda. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I yes. see that. Thank you very much. Yes. Tonight's not my night. I've included the minutes and the RFQ and um, formal the adoption of the resolution that was presented to Mr. Kelly and also a budget ordinance amendment to um, appropriate some grant money that was received toward the um, fire camp this summer. The appointment sheets for the next. Okay, so that, that was all contained in the consent in agenda. In the consent agenda, passed. and I missed that. They're on two different pages, so thank you. Committee appointments. Lisa? Yes, I apologize. I did not prepare written ballots. I'm so sorry. You've been busy. We can go old school. So there are two candidates for the Environmental Advisory Committee. These are three regular terms ending in June of 2027 um, and one expi unexpired term ending in June 2026. There are also two unexpired, unexpired terms ending in June in 2025. Um, we have two candidates. Uh, the first is Sue Davidson, and the second is Lee Maxwell. Both of these are uh, have reapplied for their uh, positions on the EAC. So that leaves three more positions that are open, Lisa? Yes. yes. And I would like to suggest that we vote for the two terms ending June 2027. Yeah, the three terms. Well, there's we two candidates. We only have two candidates. two candidates for three terms. No need, yeah. no need to appoint them for a 12-month period when we have a 36-month period. Well, and we need two for June 2025, so we could do Don't have any candidates. Two. We don't have enough candidates. Oh, it's not clear to me which, which positions these candidates have applied for. That's what he's... Lisa, do we know what they've applied for? Um, they did not indicate it specifically. That's so, what I thought. Okay. And, and um, generally, I would put them into the longest terms available. Longest terms available. I think that was what. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Craft was attempting to clarify. Get more bodies, probably. These are two good members. Both candidates received unanimous votes to be reappointed. 
Excellent. And just to clarify, two terms ending in June of 2027. Yes, ma'am. So congratulations, congratulations to Sue Davidson and Lee Maxwell. Administrative reports. Um, our town manager, Catherine, do you want to start us off? Thank you. I just want to also take this moment to say on behalf of all the staff um, how we acknowledge and appreciate the great work of David Kelly um, and appreciate what all he has done for this town. He was a mentor and a friend to many here on staff and he will be missed. Um, I want to say a, a word too to the citizens just to assure you that um, David and I have worked hard over the last several months to try to ensure a very smooth transition um, with the help of all the dedicated staff here. We do not want to miss a beat and we're committed to continue to provide the best services for the town. And I also appreciate the trust and confidence in me in the interim, so thank you. I have two quick items administratively. Um, first, I know council's been discussing how to move forward with the UDO, um, and that discussion in the meetings. We'd like to suggest that we get your calendars together, maybe through the clerk for four, maybe two hour meetings to break it up so that you could take that large task in smaller bites. Um, unless there are other suggestions, I just wanna keep that ball rolling forward and Lisa will work with you to get that on your schedule. Is that okay? May I make a request? Please. That these UDO meetings be held in a workshop format similar to our budget meetings with the concurrence of council. Perfect. I think that the during our regular town council meetings at this format is a bit restrictive um, and would appreciate the opportunity for uh, free conversation across staff and council. Is that okay with all the council? Very sensible Perfect. idea, yep. Madam Mayor. Um, we'll do that. I'm going to ask once again for Mr. Kirkland's Absolutely. review sheet. He is working manager. on that and we will have it before these meetings start. We will have a summary with uh, a delta of the changes and the implications. He's working on that, thank you. If I could just add one thing there. So rather than trying to book four two hour meetings out of the gate, which might be somewhat challenging, is can we initially just plan to book two, and then we can add two more if we need those two? Because trying to coordinate calendars for four meetings is it's like herding cats. That's fine, and you can always just recess the second meeting. Okay, thank while you. While you're at, at that meeting, pick a date and time to recess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Catherine. And secondly, just briefly, I know the crosswalks is a very hot topic, so I want to continue to provide council and the citizens with updates on that regularly. I've asked Scott to come forward and give us the latest. Good evening, everyone. Real quick, um, the crosswalks on East Beach, we have um, we've hired an engineering company. The DOT requires stamped engineered plans with a survey for each one. So that is in the process now, and that should be about the last piece of the puzzle. We'll get that to them, and they should grant us a, the permits to do it. The actual work will be done in-house by Public Works, so that'll save us some money on that. Um, also, the sidewalk project, we've submitted the um, sample contracts the DOT that they asked for, so we're waiting to hear back from them, and then uh, hopefully that will get moving and they'll get their bid package together and get that project rolling. So I'm trying to do real quick grants. I know um, we also received a grant that's nowhere near what y'all talked about, but we did get a grant for a ADA compliant kayak launch that we're gonna install by the rec center and then we'll relocate the one there elsewhere. Excellent. And that was quick. Thank you. That's all I have, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Eads. I want to echo the sentiments about Mr. Kelly. I've known him for quite some time, and uh, he really cared about the town. I wish him and his family their best, uh, the best in their future endeavors. And um, as you know, I wasn't here last month. I've been somewhat under the weather, so I appreciate uh, the council's uh, understanding of that as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. 
Moving to um, old business. <coughs> no, I'm sorry. Staff update. Yep. Uh, staff update for implementation of Chapter 32 revision. Thank you, Steve Edwards. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, the tree and vegetation update. We started implementing the uh, ordinance uh, March 15th as directed by Council back in the January adoption of the meeting. Uh, upon the beginning of the implementation of the program, we trained staff first after uh, the approval of the, or the denial of the second portion that was still being reviewed back in March. At the council meeting, uh, we trained all the development services staff on the new rules and procedures, and we had attendance of 15 staff members there for that training session. Uh, that same day, we put on the first training session for the uh, contractors. Uh, it was in the evening, and we had 18 that showed up for that meeting. And then we had a, a second meeting the next day. We did three consecutive meetings. Uh, for the contractors, and, and they all showed up mostly on the first meeting. The second meeting, only two showed up. The third meeting, no, nobody showed up. Uh, since then, we've been having a lot of one-on-ones individually with tree cutting services, property owners wanting better understanding what was going on. Uh, I personally don't have a Facebook account, but I hear there was a, you know, that it's been used to circulate some of the information. Some of it may have been a little incorrect or premature with fees and things like that because they hadn't been adopted yet or approved, I shouldn't say adopted. Um, but it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a lot going on and it surprised me at the number of people that have called over the last couple of months wanting to consult and about having trees cut. And we, we implemented just a standard policy starting out that we want to review all trees that were being cut because we wanted to verify three things. One, that it's their tree, that it's not on the neighbor's property or, or it's not a tree that's on the public property, the right of way. Uh, two, that if it is a diseased tree or if it's a heritage tree or if it's in danger of, of falling uh, near a structure. Um, and out of all of those, we've, we've had a plethora of trees that uh, we're on the town property from, from the implementation of March 15th until the first week of June, we had done 46 site visits for property owners wanting to cut down trees. Um, approximately 15 trees were identified as being trees in the town right away. They were public trees, so they were denied to be cut. And of course, if we hadn't implemented a policy of wanting to inspect these trees before they cut them to assure they were their trees, or they were the heritage tree that was protected, um, we wouldn't have saved those 15 trees. The property owners would have probably cut them down, not knowing any better that they, it's hard to tell sometimes where the boundary lines are. Most citizens think they own to the edge of the pavement, which is not correct. There's a right of way that's 50 feet, 60 feet, and 100 feet are about the three average mm -hmm. town right of ways that we have. So it's, it's hard to tell which right of way you're in and where those boundary lines are. Um, the Taft, there was 19 heritage trees that the owners wanted to cut down that we denied because they were healthy trees and, and they didn't need to be cut down. Um, we did uh, discover, you know, through some complaints that our, our, your, your neighbors are very helpful sometimes in calling, letting us know what you're doing, and um, we get those calls regularly, and, and we found that three heritage trees had been removed. And, uh, but we were able to um, identify that they were diseased and they met those criteria, so we didn't issue any fines. We did issue fines on the first of it, but after talking with the tree cutter and the homeowner, it, and they had documentation, because we couldn't tell the tree was gone, that it was a, it was a d diseased and dying tree. So we, we were able not to issue any fines for those. Moving forward, though, we, we we're definitely, if someone cuts down a tree, a heritage tree, without the proper approval, we will be looking at issuing fines as it so states in the ordinance. Um, and, and Bryce Taylor has taken over the stormwater administrator's position. We, we, Rick Patterson left the town to take another job out up in West Virginia. And uh, so uh, we, we've been putting it back together with Bryce and Bryce has um, 
taken over 80 phone calls also, as well as in addition to the 47 trees talking about the tree plants, the vegetation, and, and, and getting the public educated just through those forms of communication. I, I did put down uh, some goals that we'd like to start scheduling some more meetings with the uh, real estate agents because they need to know about the one year calendar clock for planted trees and, and if it doesn't after a CO has been issued or the final approval for the zoning has been issued, not necessarily CO because in severe weathers and the heat where planting is not acceptable, we could stay the planting of the trees and, and then but as once the trees are completed and CO is issued, the one year clock starts for that tree. So we want to get that information out to the real estate agents to make them aware when they're selling these new properties that those trees are going to be reinspected within that one year period from the issuance of the completion of the zoning permit. Um, we feel like that's something that needs to be disseminated out quickly. Um, we want the we, we do have a, a link ready. We're just waiting for the final approvals on any fees that will or will not be charged and how we want to move the program forward. Uh, we'd like to uh, get that link going as quickly as possible. Uh, so, and it, it, it takes you to the whole tree ordinance because right now it's not codified in the UDO. So, so it's, we have to cut and paste it, but we'll, we'll work on getting, like the other gentleman said this evening, um, straight to the point. You know, don't have to you know, wade through those 15 pages. So we'll, we'll look at improving that website as, or that link as we move forward. Um, the, um, we want to schedule additional tree and vegetation outreach programs. Uh, I think one of the things that Bryce did was he did go to the Arbor Day event back on uh, April 26, and he met with uh, about 60 people that were there. And he visited each um, vendor and table and, and, and talked with them as well. So he was out there that day doing that as well. Uh, and and we I've also put down here, I'd like to produce a tree and vegetation presentation that will be linked to the town website. I, I was thinking this gentleman must have read my, uh, my, my information because he paraphrased exactly what, what I was recommending here. Um, and we want to use the current uh, as, a, as a place to put articles in there on a regular basis to educate the public as well and then put links in there that'll take them to the, to the um, tree and vegetation worksheets, permit application, and that information. I, I would recommend that we continue to seek, you know, not so much permits, but, you know, submit an application for any tree removal just so we can verify that, again, that it's their tree, that it meets the criteria of the um, heritage trees that can be removed. And if not, we would have lost several trees out of the 47 site visits that we have done. If we if we hadn't have been asking for those, but I would I would recommend that that we do that. And of course, if there's the heritage tree that meets the criteria to be cut down, then we can issue them a permit that gave them the approval to remove that tree, so they'll have that for their records, and we'll have it for ours. But that's um that's about it. Questions for Steve? Yeah, I was going to ask you about Steve the. Um, uh, policy. Can you give us maybe a couple, three or four bullet points from that? I mean, one of the things that I know you and I chatted about were um, the thought of having um, and every homeowner on the island um, submit an application for removal of any tree is a daunting task, certainly for all the residents and homeowners, and B, for your staff with, you know, 10,000, 12,000 homes on the island. So what, well, what is that? policy going to be? Like I said, there was 46 that we had um, done just in that short period of time from March 15th to the first week of June. It will be daunting, but, you know, if you want to preserve and protect trees, I, I think we need to be willing to take on that daunting task. Uh, you know, the, the, the application format that that uh, Mike and I worked on, uh, it it's very simple. It'll be online. It's, it's a fill in. You put in your information and you put it in there and you hit submit. And then from once they hit submit, it'll be disseminated to three staff members where we can generate the work order to go out there and look. And as maybe as the education goes on, we can look at pulling back from that 
And um, I, I think the arborists are on board, but what, what I don't want is somebody to go out there and say, oh, I can cut this tree down, and then they'll get a phone call from the neighbor. Just this, this week alone, Bryce has had deny a couple of tree cutting permit requests because they were the neighbor's trees. And you, you, you wouldn't be happy you came home and saw your tree cut down, and of course they're gonna be calling us and um, filing complaints. I just, uh, you know, it, it, I think that at least in the beginning of the program, we, we should require this just for educational purposes. I can attest that um, there was a tree service that was requested for um, uh, trimming a tree and the service denied the homeowner. Uh, they said they weren't allowed to touch the tree without the town being involved. Um, to get permit, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure we Is might it, we might somehow educate about whether trimming a tree versus removing a tree and to what extent where that line is. But well, the, the the line is pretty clear. Tree removal, the tree's gone. Okay. <laughs> so anything short of that? Anything short of that? I mean, you know, of course, I've I've seen people come in and top it pretty heavily, also. And kill the tree. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's not the best thing. But you know, if they're if they're going through a, a tree company, a, a service, especially the ones that have been doing it for years or, or have certifications as the arborist uh, certifications are available to obtain to these companies, they they know what to do. Um, they sometimes use the department as an excuse as well to not to do something. Two things, Steve. Uh, first, thank you for being proactive on the education and communication. Uh, so often people say they just don't know what the, what the story is. So thank you for being in front of that. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, Bryce is going to be doing the stormwater and being do doing the tree uh, studies. Does he have help coming? We, we, well, we, yes, we, he, do, he does have help com coming. And there's also in the budget the allowance for a, a tree arborist, which that's going to be utilized more for public trees because we don't want to, uh, staff doesn't recommend having an arborist go out and as a representative of the town to talk with the property owner about their trees. They should need hire their own arborist. We can provide them with a list of qualified arborists in this area, but, uh, but Bryce will have help with um, staff. Uh, Development Services has a big arm with zoning and they they help out as well so right now we're we're managing good deal appreciate you thank and you and we are a little behind on the education my apologies on that well, but, yeah. but you're on it thank yeah. you council anything else thank you very much you're welcome Catherine. anything else we're good yeah. on to old business uh Consideration of a memorandum of agreement with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the Wilmington Harbor Project. Um, so essentially, we need a motion. Correct me if I'm. Go ahead, Lisa. You so take we, it. we listed it as a memorandum of agreement, anticipating that they would have that for us today, and they did not. So we just have the letter of intent. If we could have a motion to approve a letter of intent. The letter of intent. So moved, Madam Mayor. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Lisa. Uh, next, consideration of directing the planning board to provide a recommendation to limit house size on the island and in R7 on the mainland. Mr. Chula. Yeah, clicker. Hey, Mike, can you cue that up, please? Thank you. Okay, pre two months ago, <clears throat> we made I had uh, made a recommendation that we move forward with um, putting some sort of limitation on the size of new home construction. So it was pushed to today's meeting, and I want to take a, it's a couple of slides to walk through um, two different scenarios. Um, and I think that we need to visual just to make sure to show people uh, just to be very clear here. 
So the objective for the um, zoning change proposal, we have it in front of us. Um, but Oak Island residents and homeowners have asked us to limit house size and maintain the small town feel of our community. Um, this is stated loud and clear in our comprehensive land use plan, as well as on election day. Um, current house building trends, regardless of lot size, of 3,995 square foot, 14 bedroom, 15 bathroom, three-story houses with roof decks, elevated pools are built for full-time rental uses and not neighborhood homes for Oak Island families. So option one, and that's what we initially had, I initially proposed we were going to bring up tonight, was just to assign a maximum square footage for all new house construction of 3,500 square feet, removing the special use permit options. And with the special use permit removal, the largest allowable new house construction is 3,500 square feet. So it's simple approach, uh, one size fits all regardless of the size of the lot. It's easy to monitor and very easy to execute. So instead of just passing one option to the planning board, I did a lot of research and there's a lot of other ways that the planning board um, can review to see what other options are available for them to limit um, home size. So after um, countless hours of review, came up with option two. So option two, so there's only two options, we, that's the recommend, gonna, gonna be the recommendation for tonight, is what they call floor area ratio. So floor area ratio ensures that the size of new home construction is proportionate to the size of the lot. And just walk you through the math real quick for us here as well as for the, the uh, audience. So a typical lot size of 6,600 square feet using a ratio of 0.45, the maximum square feet of new home construction is 2,970 square feet. For corner lots, a little bit oversized lots of 7,500, using that same ratio, the maximum square footage for them is 3,375. And lastly, the larger lots, such as those on the point at the golf course, uh, maximum square footage would be 4,000. So removing the special use permit for both options would give them the opportunity of building a 4,000 square foot home on those very large lots. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here. There's some risks, there's potential loopholes, and we really need to be um, dot the I's and cross the T's if this is the recommendation that the planning board is gonna come back with. So our future if we do nothing is what we have right now. So wave one, um, currently underway, undeveloped beach lots continue to get developed with no regard to lot size. Um, 3,995 square foot, three-story new rental home construction and East and West Beach Drive already have dozens of those. Wave two is next, uh, where beach bungalows are purchased by developers, demolished, relocated, and replaced with those same three-story, 3,995 square foot uh, rental homes. And lastly, and most, I think, disconcerting to a lot of people is potential for wave two plus. So the bungalows north of Oak Island Drive are purchased by developers demolished or relocated and are replaced with oversized rental home construction. So this is an attempt to do something as opposed to do nothing. Previous councils have taken this discussion up about removing the special use permit, and unfortunately it just hasn't gotten anywhere. So this is an attempt to, let's see if we can get somewhere. So I want to give you a nice visual here. So these two new construction homes, these are next to Lazy Turtle. Lazy Turtle you can see to the far left, and these two no new homes are going into the far Right, 607 Ocean Drive, 609 Ocean Drive. 30, both are 3,995 permitted heated square feet, three-story new construction, 14 bedrooms and 15 bathrooms, uh, 0.17 acres, um, which is approximately 7,405 7, square feet, um, and they both have rooftop terraces. Representative houses number two, potential wave number two, is we have this, this large rental home property, 7703 East Beach Drive, 3,645 square foot, 10 bedroom, 10 bath, three stories, um, and it sits right next to a beach bungalow of 1,677 square feet. Four bedroom, two bathroom home, a one story traditional bungalow. So this is our future if we do nothing and it's gonna to continue to happen up and down Beach Drive. So my motion for tonight 
I ask my fellow council members to have the courage tonight to take the first step beginning with removing the special use permit to stop the insanity and preserve, while we still can, our residential community. While many of the cows have left the barn, we still have plenty of cows left in the barn, which we can save. So my motion for tonight, I make a motion the town council re recommend approval to send the planning board a single family dwelling text amendment applicable to all new residential construction on Oak Island proper and R7 on the mainland. Number one, eliminating the special use permit exemption process. Number two, considering equally, equally both viable options one and two. Option one, again, to reiterate, limiting new home construction to a maximum of 3,500 square feet, eliminating the special use permit. Option two, using the floor area ratio option with a ratio of 0.45, limiting new house construction to 4,000 square feet, eliminating the special use permit. Planning board to provide a thorough and detailed review and analysis of each option, providing pros and cons of both, and bring their recommendations to town council by August 26, 2024, so that town council may vote on September 10th, 2024. I'll second your motion, Mr. Chulo. Discussion. I have a lot to say. Uh, I'm going to start off. Bob and I are in agreement. We both want to stop special use permits. We look at it differently, though. I did my due diligence. I called other beach towns to see what their maximum square foot restrictions they have. Carolina Beach. Ocean Isle Beach, Holden Beach, Wrightsville Beach, every town I spoke to said they do not have a square foot maximum. They utilize impervious surface setback requirements. Option number two, that's where I am. Most lots in Oak Island are 0.21 acres, as Bob pointed out. That's roughly a 2,800 square foot house. To get to 4,000 square feet, you need almost two lots. You need 13,000 uh, square foot buildable area. People have said we are becoming a miniature Myrtle Beach. I want to address that while I'm talking. Margate Towers in Myrtle Beach is 329 feet high. Our maximum is 41 feet high. Margate Towers in Myrtle Beach has 29 stories. So saying we're turning into a miniature Myrtle Beach, that's a scare tactic. Cama stated Oak Island Beach Houses could be 5,000 square feet. A town council before I arrived took it down to 4,000 square feet. People bought property relying on that. They relied on 4,000 square feet. Now Bob and I disagree on option number one, taking it even lower. When is enough enough? When it went to 4,000 square feet, builders and other people did not revolt. Somewhere, builders and property rights attorneys are going to challenge the town for going so far below CAMA guidelines. That's a slippery slope. So having said all that, I'm in agreement with, with my councilman, Chu Lo. 4,000 square feet is what I recommend. No SUPs. Uh, Makes common sense. If I may, Bob, I even have a PowerPoint. I have six slides, uh, and I've never done a PowerPoint. So here goes nothing, folks. Uh, Mike, if you could put it up there, please, sir. I told you I'd never done one. This house is at 5425 West Beach. It is 2,201 square feet, five bedrooms, five baths. Nobody has a problem with that. That house is 41 feet high. The next house is 7405, 7005 West Beach. I call that a mini hotel. I call that a mega house. Its next door neighbor is 7001 West Beach. I call that a mini hotel. I call that a mega house. The reason it is legal is our UDO says if they qualify with everything, harmony in the neighborhood, they get a special use permit. 
I want to stop spatial use permits. Right next door to 7001 West Beach is a vacant lot. Tomorrow, if they apply for a spatial use permit, our language says, if they are, the council shall, not may, issue a spatial use permit if it is determined that it is in harmony with the adjoining properties. The adjoining properties are mega houses and many hotels. What I want to do is I don't want to turn Oak Island into a homeowners association where you got to ask permission to put gravel up or put a basketball go up or cut a tree or anything else. Somewhere along the way, we have to stop and let people do, do what we told them they can do. We told them they could have a 4,000 square foot house. I want to start telling people they can't have a spatial use permit. So I'm in agreement with you, Bob. I want to stop spatial use permits, but I want to go to 4,000 square feet uh, for houses. And I'll hush. So, well, <laughs> I'm happy my colleagues agree on something. This is this is encouraging. Uh, there is a history here. Uh, Councilman Kraft and I voted for a restriction. Uh, unfortunately, we were in the minority. So, if we can all agree on special use permit, which I I know we do not, that would be progress. I think the most important thing is for the planning board to really take a look at this alternative calculation, which we're not familiar with. Um, and I do think that between 3,500 and 4,000 square feet, if it comes to that, we're going to be able to change the dynamic of this, this island because what both of you have illustrated is what people say to me, it's out of control. And I'm forced to say, yeah, but it's legal. It's within all of our ordinances, and people just shake their head, like, what, what are you guys doing? So above all, we, we need action on this, right? We, we need to come together, and hopefully we can, with the planning board analysis, we'll get something that will illustrate the advantages and disadvantages of each. So I support the motion, support uh, the convergence around uh, removing the SUPs, then it falls to the planning board and our supplemental regulations in the UDO to make sure it is tight because otherwise people will find the loopholes. So um, this is progress, however, the differences that still remain between us. Yeah, so obviously I seconded the motion and Mr. Chulo and I have worked on, on this issue for uh, some time now. I don't want to debate the issue tonight, but I do want to send it to planning board. That's their job, get them to do what we ask them to do, and then have a, a robust discussion around what they send back. I, I would agree. Um, it's not uh, neither here nor there to try to debate this issue tonight. Everybody knows where I stand on this issue. Um, so no surprises with how I plan to vote. But I would like to point out a couple of things. The first thing I need is, is clarification on the intent of the motion. Is the intent of the motion that planning board can only deliberate option one or option two? What if the planning board wants to discuss, um, say, option two with the floor area ratio option, but with the calculation of a 45% ratio, it's actually greater than 4,000 square feet. Your math's off there, Bob. And so would yeah, would 4, we allow, feet. nope, I get my time, please. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I was yep. just trying to correct you. Okay. So I believe there could be another option for planning board as an instruction, which would be planning board should be able to consider business as usual, the way our ordinance is written today. Planning board should also be able to consider honoring the 5,000 square foot maximum that's established by the CRC, which establishes building standards for coastal areas. So I'm concerned that we're trying to paint the planning board into a corner and force them to choose one or the other, and they can't debate openly other options or discuss business as usual freely in their conversation. So that's, that's a point of clarification I'd like to address in the motion, please. May I? Mm -hmm. Please. Okay. So um, I appreciate the, the, the math calculation error. So 4,000 square foot, um, Councilman Martin, is the removing the special use permit. That's the maximum it can be. 
So regardless of what it comes out to, which is north of 5,000, 4,000 is a hard limit without the special use permit. You know, there's a myriad of things the planning board can consider. Councilman Kraft mentioned permeable um, space, square footage. You can uh, number of parking spaces there. You can, there's dozens of these. And if we simply leave it open-ended to the planning board, they can debate this from now until, you know, Christmas of next year. So these are two common sense solutions that my, my motion, I believe, is a common sense solution, two different options, and that's what the motion is. So yes, limit it to just these two options um, and bring those, those recommendations forward. Well, uh, seeing that there's uh, members of the planning board in the audience, I hope they received my comment and will take that into their deliberations uh, when they open up for discussions. So I guess the other option would be if we present them without the ability to freely discuss this option, they could essentially reject both option one and option two. That would be a, an option for them to, to select. Um, and then just clarification for the for maybe the audience, those here live and listening now or, or later. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about a comment on uh, slide two, which is where your content starts. And I'm glad Steve's still here. I know Matt had to leave. But your, your third bullet says that current house building trends, regardless of lot size, I would beg to challenge that point the lot size actually does control the size of the dwelling that can be built because we do have in our ordinance today items like setback, impervial surface area, building heights. All of these control points are in our ordinance today that dictate the size of the dwelling that can go on the parcel. So the lot size absolutely drives the size of the dwelling. It's not regardless of, the lot size does come into play, all right? The other concern I have is on your final bullet on this slide, number two, and I believe this is a little dangerous, the comment here, because now that it's been presented, it's in the record, uh, it's duly noted, um, that you're, it looks like you're targeting full-time investment rental houses. This is dangerous in my point of view because the Fair Housing Act may come into play where if you are targeting a specific classification of a owner of a piece of property, we're running up against a really gray area that I'm concerned about that we're targeting a specific type of property owner. And I believe that that might be a violation of a law. Um, finally, um, you mentioned repeatedly uh, the removal of special use permits uh, in relationship to houses under 4,000 square feet. Just so everyone's clear, in our ordinance today, all homes under 4,000 square feet do not require a special use permit. The special use permit only kicks in for houses over 4,000 square feet. So I just want that clarification for the audience uh, as a reminder that we don't issue special use permits for houses under 4,000 square feet. All right, and then last but not least, your slide number five, all of your bullet points about wave one and wave two and wave two plus, it's all speculative. And I, and I want people to understand that. These are scenarios that that may happen, but there's no guarantee that it's gonna happen. You don't, you don't have any control over the property owner's desire to sell their property, hold on to their property, make it a generational property and pass it on to other family members. Maybe it's their retirement. Maybe they bought this house 40 years ago and, and they got a good deal on it. And now the, the houses being built around it are driving up the land value and that person is just sitting there waiting for their retirement nest egg to kick in so they can sell the property and retire and enjoy their life. So it's, it's very advantageous to speculate what an, an adjacent property owner may or may not do with that property, what their goals are, what their financial position may be. And it's certainly not appropriate 
to speculate that every single parcel on the island is going to be replaced with a with a rental home. We can't set parameters to control the rental marketplace. That's going to expand and contract to meet market demands. I had someone ask me back in 2021 when I was running for town council if I would limit rental homes. And I was like, well, no. Why, why would we try to do that? Because what if my neighbor suddenly needs financial assistance for whatever reason, and maybe renting their home is an option that bridges that gap for them so they can keep making the mortgage payment or pay the utilities. But why would I deter my neighbor's ability to rent their home if they're in financial need? So it's, it's very reckless for us to make assumptions about what property owners may or may not do with their homes. We, we have an ordinance in place today it provides the control points that we need. Even the SUP, yes, I'm in favor of the SUP process because it does give us the ability to place conditions on the property. And in many, many, many occasions, we always apply conditions to the property, whether it's architectural design standards, whether it's making sure water and sewer capacity serve the property, you know, whether we look at pedestrian safety around the property, or how the traffic flow is gonna be. We look at all of these things in a special use permit because we can apply these conditions to that property. And so yeah, those houses that exceed 4,000 square feet come with conditions and we have control over that. So if you remove the special use permit, number one, we don't need it for less than four. And I guess you're trying to say that we're just gonna cap everything at 4,000 and therefore we don't need a special use permit. That doesn't solve the pictures that you showed. Every single one of those houses you presented are under 4,000 square feet. They won't need a special use permit. They can be built on, on many of the parcels that are on the island, but there's no guarantee that they will be built. We have no historical record that every single parcel that's sold suddenly becomes a, a 3,000 or 3,900 square foot house. And I would challenge you to recognize the fact that growth was inevitable for Oak Island. Do you think people freaked out when the ferry shut down <coughs> and they built Barbary Bridge? The people that were here, they probably said, oh my gosh, that bridge is gonna ruin us, right? But the ferry went away and, and we have a bridge. Do you think people freaked out when the first large home was built, which is in 1975, somewhere around 75 or 76? Steve, you might have a better memory than I do. Large homes started appearing in our landscape back in the 70s. We're 50 years into this, people. So, and Councilman Kraft mentioned a great point, and that is there's expectations around people that own property. They see what's being built, they see design, they, they understand what's possible, they've been sitting on these parcels, and now it's time for them to make their dream come true. I just, I just really think we're heading into a, an area that we have no business trying to, to do anything outside of what we already do today. Business as usual, everything's fine. There's no need to hit the panic button. Stop using fear tactics in the public. It's not gonna be Myrtle Beach, as Councilman Kraft pointed out. I'll close my discussion there. Thank God. I'll just, just a quick clarification, if I may. So, you know, you, you mentioned the special use permit, Councilman Martin, being a great resource and a great tool, but it, it's a great tool that's been used against us time and time and time again. You talked about the restrictions you could put in with respect to walkability and lighting and things. You're talking about a commercial special use permit, not a residential special use permit. So that's first and foremost. But when you say everything is fine, do nothing, keep doing what we're doing, and that's exactly what we've been doing, is doing nothing and kink this continuous trend that's taking place with homes. Notice in the presentation, I use homes and I use houses. 14 bedroom, 15 bath, that is a house, it's not a home. So please, you, you, you would cross in those words, I was very, um, analytical in the way I use those those words in the presentation. Madam Chair. I'll stand down. Yes. I think we had agreed. I want to let Councilman Martin, out of respect, finish his initial statement, but 
we agreed that we're going to debate this when it comes back to us. I do think, um, by implication, Councilman Martin, if the planning board threw up their hands and said, we don't like any of this, they probably have that option. But this is a directed, consider these two things and report back. We, we can have this colloquy when it comes to us, right? Everybody will have a chance. And I, again, I respect your point of view. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it should be aired. But I think we should close the discussion and move on. I have one point of clarification, and that is if the planning board decides uh, sooner than August to bring back to council a determination, um, such as was suggested, are we open to that? Or we don't want to hear it until September? No, that would be great. I was just giving, my attempt was to just give them time to. No later than. Correct. Okay. No, I, I would not be in favor of trying to rush the planning board decision. No, I'm not saying if they chose to. Madam Mayor, we have a motion and a second. I'd like to call a question. Lisa? Yes, you may have been within 20 minutes. Do you, are you asking for a roll call vote? I'm sorry. Sure. No, I just want to, to call the question. It's time to vote. Okay. Well, do you, I want a roll call vote. Okay. That okay. pleases the chair. That's fine. Okay. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Buck? Yes. Okay. Councilman Cartner? Yes. Councilman yes. Kraft? Okay. Yes. Councilman Chulo? Yes. And Councilman Martin? No. So this will be sent to the planning board with the understanding if they choose to negotiate this at a speedier pace than we've outlined, it's their privilege to do so. But we'll return a decision to us no later than August 26th, I believe. Well, I'm sorry. I don't want to prolong this either. They're going to evaluate these as per the directive. Yes. Their evaluation could be negative on both. Correct. They can return that verdict. Yeah. Right. What they can't do is return something else, right? They're going to return an affirmative or a negative on these, and we're going to evaluate it, and we'll all have a chance to debate it in detail. And I agree with Councilman Martin. I don't want this rushed. They take as much time as they need to really sure. sort through this. Exactly. I have no idea what FAR looks like on the ground. They're going to have to look at that. Absolutely. I wasn't asking them to rush it. Understood. Next, um, consideration of tree removal permit and stormwater fees. Steve? Again, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. The um, previous uh, fee schedule that we had, we removed two fees that were, were on the, well, actually removed the uh, permit application fee that was, was was removed. I did put in back a, a tree removal permit fee only because in the January meeting staff had recommended a permit fee of $100. So that that's here before you to consider. Now, and the second fee that I have is the uh, tree fund reduction of the tree DBH. That was already written in the ordinance that you could buy down the DBH if you didn't have the maximum DBH that you needed for the tree count for new construction or, or building permits that you would be acquiring. So that's just put in there for clarity, just so that it's in the fee schedule, not just in the ordinance. So this chart represents your recommendations? This chart recommends what staff had recommended back in January for the $100 tree removal fee. Um, it was originally I had it in there at 75 and at 35 for application, but I went back and pulled the, the notes and saw what staff had recommended. And I just put it in there because that was staff recommendation back at the uh, presentation in January. In January. Right. So it's your choice whether you want to um, have a fee or, or not. So these fees are more in line with what you determine to be acceptable, justified based on other fees? I think Castle Beach has a, a $50 fee, if I remember correctly. 
but they also have a $60 application fee. So I think it's a $110 fee. I don't know if that $60 is associated with a true removal fee. It may just be the 50. Any other questions for Steve? Steve, at the top of your, your fee schedule, tree fund fee heritage tree removal permit. If it is a damaged tree or a diseased tree, do they still have to pay somebody to come out to take the, a look at it? The way the ordinance is written, it, it just says that if you are granted approval to remove a heritage tree, it didn't give the criteria that if it's a healthy tree, a diseased tree, it, it, it basically says you would have to have a permit to remove it. Even if it's unhealthy? Even if it's unhealthy. The way I read the ordinance, yes. So if it's getting ready to fall on my house <laughs> and I'm broke, I have to find a hundred dollars before I can cut it down. That or be sure your insurance is paid up. <laughs> if I'm broke, I can't pay my insurance either. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, that, that, I mean, you'll be granted the, if that's the situation, you know, you'll be granted a permit to remove it. It's whether or not we want to charge fees for that. But the way the ordinance has said, if it, it just says if it meets the criteria in a tree removal permit fee, you know, will be granted. You know, we have a, we have a fund to help people with utilities and people can donate money to that fund to help people cover their utilities. Maybe the tree piece people could start a fund and provide grant money uh, to the town to help cover permitting fees for tree removal if they need assistance, if they need financial assistance. Mm -hmm. The permit fee is small compared to the cost of the tree cutting service. Right, yeah. Is there a motion? Let me, one quick, uh, with respect, Steve, to it, so there's no application fee that you're recommending. You're just recommending a $100 fee to remove the That That's correct. If, 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 the tree. If, if we approve the heritage tree to be removed, that's just for heritage trees only, not any tree. I mean, if it's not a heritage tree, no permit's required. Again, we just want to be sure that it's their tree, it's not a public tree, it's not a neighbor tree. And then, it, you know, so, and if it's that, then they don't have a per, they don't have to have a permit to remove any other tree. You cut down an eight, eight inch tree, just go out in the yard and cut it down? Yeah. <coughs> and as, as long as it's your tree, don't cut right, down your neighbor's yeah. tree. Yeah. Right away. But we will know it's your tree if we don't go out there and look at it. Like I said, two this week alone. I'm good. And that's $100 per tree. I would. So there's a cop. I would say if you, if, you have, be... if you have three heritage trees that you're going to remove and they meet the criteria for removal, I think the one permit would, I think would suffice. I wouldn't do one permit for each tree. I think that would be a little unfair. Is the... Is the intent here twofold? First of all, there's a certain level of, I'll call it benign control in the process. We know where the tree is and we examine it. And the fee also offsets part of the cost of having staff or the arborist go out there, right? It's a heritage that, tree, you're going to send an arborist, correct? If it's our tree, yes. If okay. it's a town tree, if it's a private tree, I, I, I would like to have conversations, you know, about that with the town attorney, about any liability if a, a town arborist were to uh, look at a tree. So, Councilman Bach, that brings up a, a good point. And Steve, you weren't in my agenda review meeting, but um, Ms. Adams and Mr. Kelly and the mayor and I had a fairly lengthy discussion about the process, and we even talked about creating a flow chart, if you will, to show people how to proceed through the process. And one of the things we discussed was we don't want to pay for a service that we don't charge a homeowner for. We're not, we shouldn't be paying for things for citizens. So maybe part of the process is uh, one option we talked about was to have the homeowner obtain their own arborist and they can show that they had a certified arborist look at their tree and it met one of the criteria or it didn't meet one of the criteria. But um, we even talked about the idea of having a small working group of a couple of council members, staff, <coughs> um, maybe the EAC, 
to look at how to make sure we define the process and make it easy for people to follow. And so I, I know that doesn't have to do with the, the fee schedule, but I think it's something that we need to think about and do a little more work on. I agree. Just one more quick comment. For the neighbors that are calling on neighbors, I don't understand that. Get to know your neighbor. <laughs> I'll tell you one of the best things that probably happened when we first moved here. My wife and I bought our house in June of 2018. Terry was our neighbor. We met her like weekend number one, and we all sat down and agreed how we would manage and clear and clean up the property line that separated our houses, and we got to work. And we actually worked together collectively deciding what shrubs stayed, which ones left, what weeds were moved, and we even took a fence down, I think, if I remember correctly. So just get to know your neighbor, and, and y'all can work things out. I mean, come on. We're, we're the town of Oak Island, right? So. so a proposal I'd like to make, if we could, just for, since this is so new for residents and homeowners, that I'd ask the council um, contemplate not charging for a 2024-2025 permit fee, and then we relook at it in 2025-2026. You know, we want to remove obstacles, I think. It's such a new policy, but removing obstacles for residents and homeowners to ask them to follow these rules as opposed to just taking out a chainsaw. But the $100 fee, I think, is a good idea. I just, in the first year, I'd like to just to consider waiving that. Yeah, my only concern with that is I think the $100 helps cover cost. You know, we have administrative costs associated to issuing a permit. And so I would think in the first year, we may likely see more permits than we, and maybe we see a decline in the number of permits as the years go by. I, I don't know, but I, I kind of like the $100 permit fee to help try to recover some of our administrative costs. I, I concur there. with with both. I, I think uh, Councilman Carton has a, a wonderful suggestion. We should have a simplified approach to this so that I could pick it up and without having to wade through things online or going to websites. So okay, this is what I need to do, and this is how I do it. I, I do think it's it's customary. If you provide a service, you charge a fee. You know. What that number is is a recommendation from administration. Um, we can adjust it next year. If this turns out to be disastrous or too time consuming or ineffectual, we can change it. Well, in my understanding is too, there's no cost to apply. There's only a cost if the town decides, yep, that tree can be removed. Now you pay $100 to remove the tree. So if you apply and there's no cost, and then the town says you can't remove that tree, there was no cost to the to the property owner, right? And we saved the tree. And we saved the tree. That's the point. Which I thought was the whole point of the program. That is the point. <laughs> I'm good. So, we need, according to Lisa, we need a motion to approve the amendments to the fee schedule as presented this evening. I'll second that. All in favor? Opposed? Chiro and Cartner are opposed. So passes. Steve, um, I only want, I would hope that we can clarify um, in terms of each application <coughs> that it's, that an application can include more than one tree. Yes. And likewise, each offense so we have a neighbor municipality that charged a considerable, like tens of thousands of dollars to a developer who cleared a lot without complying with their, um, I think you know the case, without complying with that municipality's tree ordinance. Um, and they now risk losing their ability to enforce their tree ordinances so for the sake of um, clarification, if we could clarify those two areas okay. so that there's no doubt about 
what that means, it would be great. Okay. Thank you. Um, consideration of requests for proposals for recreation needs assessment and facilities evaluation. Councilwoman Cartner. Yes, yeah, so if uh, council remembers at the January 24th retreat, we talked about the um, recently issued RFP that went out uh, some time ago and we only received one uh, proposal from a company who may or may not have been the best match for a needs assessment. And so at the time, uh, council saved Mr. Martin. He wasn't here, so I don't want to speak for him. Um, agreed that I would look at a revision to the uh, proposal. And um, so that's, that's what I have done. Um, the document was sent to the, uh, was then assistant town manager, now the interim town manager for review. The only thing I want to point out is that it's unlikely that there will be one firm that can do both things that we're asking for, the needs assessment and the facility evaluation. The, the needs assessment firm will be able to tell us if our spaces are big enough. They won't be able to evaluate the building in terms of what are, what, how are the mechanical systems, how are the plumbing systems, those, those physical kinds of things. But we, it's set up in this RFP so that um, one or the other firms could subcontract with a partner who can, um, so that they can provide a turnkey service. So in essence, you're kind of in favor of alternative number two. Uh, no, I'm really, I'm really in favor of just sending out one RFP and I had a long discussion with Ms. Adams about it. Um, and we think that in terms of expediency, um, we, you know, get us a little further down the road a little faster. Yeah, I, I support consolidation. I think we're going to lose time if we have two separate vendors, even if they're working in tandem. I would much prefer the responsibility be centralized. And Ms. Adams, it's my understanding we already have the money in the budget for this. Yes, no? Yes, we do. Okay. We, we're not sure what the prices will come back, of course. We have allocated some aside. Thank you for your name. A firm that we like, but they need a little help with facility evaluations. Maybe our own staff can provide some updated reports or something. I mean, right. they keep up with all of the infrastructure to support a facility, so they may be able to provide some, some kind of report or update on the condition of the facility or something. So. Um, if you do notice on page 75 and 76, the cover sheet in the first page, the dates are not filled in. That would be left up to staff to determine when they put it out and how long it needs to, how long it needs to be out for, et cetera, et cetera. So, Council, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. I make a motion that Council approve the Recreation Department Needs Assessment and Facility Evaluations RFP <coughs> and instruct staff to post the RFP publicly and send to those firms that have expressed an interest in reviewing. Second. And I, I thank you, Ms. Cartner. It's unanimous. Thank you. Woohoo. Let's get something built. Woohoo. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. Consideration of contract with Withers Ravenel for land use plan update. Catherine. Who's taking this one? That's a, a council item. I can start it for you. It's a council item. This was pulled from the agenda at the last meeting, Madam right. Mayor. So, oh, yeah. And the partner pulled it, correct? That, that's correct. And um, Mr. Eads was not with us at that time, so we had some questions about the contract itself and um, the appropriateness of having a process in a contract. Um, so I, I think someone from the town has worked with, with Withers Ravenel to make some modifications to their language in the contract. I see some red strike throughs in the terms and conditions, so somebody worked on it. This came from me. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Good to know. Thanks, Brian. Right. So to, just to recapture that conversation and uh, 
Terry, if I misstate this, please feel free to correct me. So it was pulled in part, uh, major part, because all of this process was enshrined in the contract. And I don't, I've read through this now a second time. It is uh, prescriptive. It borders on being didactic I and mean, basically telling us who we can appoint when. Uh, I'm not happy with that. Um, I, I think we need to have a second meeting with them and talk about this. The other thing is the cost structure is interesting. There are four components, and component four is $50,000 for a streetscape plan, and I think we should talk about what the deliverable is there. So while I like them, and I think they're you know, a high-powered firm, I don't want to, I personally don't want to be dictated to in terms of how committees are set up and how things are done. And I certainly want to have a second look at why component four is fifty thousand dollars of one hundred and sixty nine thousand. It seems like that's a huge chunk of money. What I maybe it, it, it may be the case I don't understand what a streetscape plan, what it takes to create that, but I'd like to hear that conversation from them. So those are my concerns with it. Having, having pulled it, I went back to it, and I thought, boy, the whole tone of this is a bit much. Yeah. Agreed, um, Councilman Bach, because that's exactly what you said, that, that for us to sign off on a contract that stipulates exactly what the process is going to be when we have yet to have the first conversation with them is odd, to say the least. So this is not a surgical change. I mean, this, to me, is more of a chainsaw change. There's a lot that's got to change in this agreement. If I can ask uh, counsel, uh, I asked Terry, and she gave me, she clarified it for me, but if you would, Brian, it says 169, not to exceed 169,000, but then their fee schedule, a couple pages over, that addresses building buildings and bringing in. I think that. And I, is that I, just a standard fee schedule page they gave us? I have seen that. I have seen Withers and uh, Ravenel contracts before, and I'm not speaking for them, but it appears to me that they have a fee schedule that applies to a various range of type of projects. Obviously, if the type of things you're talking about wouldn't be applicable to this project, we certainly wouldn't accept an invoice for that. But bottom line, no matter what they charge for, bottom line is, not to exceed 169. Right, it should be lump sum, not to exceed. So Mr. Eads, to the 169, a question I have is, we sent out an RFP and we received proposals and their fee proposal did not include $50,000 for a streetscape. So should we be signing a contract that is not that does not match up with the proposal they provided us or should we have two separate contracts? Um, well, as far as the scope of services, uh, you know, th that's more of a policy decision than a legal decision. If that's not something that we want at this point, then we could renegotiate that and exclude that from the contract. But I, I, I don't think that the, you'd have to issue a separate RFP, if that's the question. And it seems to me, really, that their Exhibit 1 is what I would almost consider the contract. Yes. Um, as to the, um, whatever they're calling this first document, agreement. <coughs> yeah. So is there a recommendation from Council? I hear us saying that we have concerns from the contract as... It stands. Um, uh, I have a recommendation. We need to meet with them again, or at least their lead representatives, express our concerns, and renegotiate part of this massive in imposition of process. And then the question about streetscape. And maybe it is something we fervently desire and need. I just don't know what it is at that cost. It seems extravagant. Uh, Matt's not here to confirm this, but we did discuss um, adding the business corridor master plan to this and i believe that's the fifty thousand. it's just called a street streetscape okay. component and we we had that money that money's allocated in the budget <coughs> no, it makes it a little more palatable i still think we should schedule another meeting with them 
much as I don't want to give us any more meetings, I think. I'm, well, I don't think. I'm reluctant to sign a contract that looks like this. Actually, I think we need to talk to them. Too many, too many uh, unknowns. Given that um, the concerns and the recommendation, how would you like to proceed? Well, we can certainly have the discussion with them and bring the information back to council, or I can set up a meeting and call them in and get your uh, calendar options. I think we can work this out over the phone and prevent you from having a full meeting on it, but if that's your choice, I will set that up as well. I would very much appreciate that and entrust it to you. That's fine. Yeah. I'm good, I'm good it's, with that. It's not uncommon for contracts of services that have bid on their RFP to attach the RFP mm. response into the contract. So it seems to me that may have been what their intent was. Um, but yep. nonetheless, we will get that very clear and bring it yep. back and see if you'd like to proceed with a meeting after you hear their response. I may not need to. I'll modify my motion to have the interim town manager contact them, express our concerns. And report back to council. Second. There's <coughs> second. second. All in favor? Okay. Can I suggest that council send to um, Catherine your list of concerns so that she's not having to reconstruct this conversation? Um, there might be other things that didn't come up in the conversation this evening that you also have concerns about, so that then, Catherine, you're able to have that conversation with them with the list. To work from is that fair right, thank you okay. is there a time by which to when would council like a report so when would you hope that this conversation would occur before the next meeting yeah that would be helpful yeah, to have yeah. the information in advance of the meeting especially for signing a contract so if the contract proposal comes back up again on the ninth, is it uh, is it realistic for y'all to have your list of concerns to Catherine by the twenty sixth, which gives her a couple of weeks to have that? Is that too tight? Um, yes, because we're meeting the eighteenth of this month, so the ca the agenda for the ninth, we have a compressed deadline to get that together. So um, if maybe we by the always, end of we can put it in the agenda and decide to remove it. Yes, but I'm just thinking it would be easier if, if concerns were provided to Ms. Adams by the end of this week. Would Sooner. That be... That's fine. Yeah. I was trying to give some leeway. Well, they put it in the agenda. Okay. Okay. Please. So if you can get your concerns to Catherine by the 21st. Fine. She has mine already. If uh, we can, Lisa, add it to the agenda mm -hmm. with the yes, idea that we can remove it, mm -hmm. then that allows us to move forward expeditiously. And Catherine, that gives you some breathing room because I know it's the end of the year, the fiscal year. We're trying to close things out. So thank you very much. On to new business. It is 938. Are you interested in finishing this meeting? I am, yes. I think we can get through a couple of these fairly quickly. Okay. We already tabled three out of five. So, consideration of renewing the lease of the town's building in the Alpon Beach area to Matthews Ministry. Who does this fall to? I had a note for Lisa. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so the town has for a number of years been renting um, what was the former development services building and the former Yopon Beach Town Hall to Matthews Ministry for an annual lease um, for a dollar <coughs> a year. And so this is just that renewal. Is there a motion for purposes of discussion? To renew the lease for another year for Matthews Ministry. I'll second that. Uh, discussion. Well, the only caveat here is that if at some point in the future, and it's not likely to be next year, we need to terminate the lease because we need the space, we would give them ample notice. That's not in there, but I think we've, we've already discussed that publicly several times. We have, times. yep. <clears throat> so other than that, no, I, I'm very supportive giving them 
another lease for another year. Any dissenting thoughts on that? I, I just have a question for Mr. Eads. Um, this renewal references previous leases, and so I just want to confirm that um, on a regular basis you review the previous leases and there's nothing additional about those that should be changed. Yes, and yes, I've reviewed it. No, I don't think there's anything, okay. particularly for this, the nature of this type of, okay. of lease. Okay, thank you. So we would um, revise this track because on page 102, Mr. Kelly is still listed as the landlord for the town. Well, he's, okay. I mean, his, his official day is not till the end of June, so I just. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Thank you. Um, all the vote? All in favor of renewing the lease agreement? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Consideration of a request to release planning and development regulations to Brunswick County for parcel with split jurisdiction in the area of Oakwood Glen. Matt isn't here, so who's taking That's that? That's right. Steve is here Steve, to address this. Thank you for very you. much. Mm -hmm. um, the first team. The uh, applicant, Donald Storns, property owner, is in the back, so he can ask your questions. Uh, what you have before you is uh, a request for a, a resolution to give all our zoning regulations over to the county. They would, any development over there, he would go through the county for permitting. Mr. Uh, Starnes has two parcels over there that he purchased back in uh, December of 2023, I believe, in, uh, somewhere thereabouts. And he did combine them to one parcel. And so his house is actually located in the county and the parcel that he's purchased and he's utilizing as part of his yard now is, is in the town of Oak Island jurisdiction. And, and there is a um, state statute that gives you guidance on how to handle split parcels. You can, through mutual agreement, through the county and the town, we can release our duties for development purposes to the county. It's still, the property's still in Oak Island. It's uh, up on the monitor now. Uh, the green is the Oak Island jurisdiction, and the uncolored areas are the um, the county jurisdiction. <coughs> and the parcel that Mr. Um, Starnes is looking to do, he, he has cleared, and, and there is a uh, code violation currently on the property because he put a driveway in that didn't meet our standards. And I don't know if he was thinking that he was counting and it didn't matter because I don't think the county requires a permit for a driveway. So he did it not in, you know, not in intent of violating our ordinance. He just felt like it was a county regulation uh, dealing. And but so to, to, to process this, the town has to adopt a resolution uh, given the county the authority to regulate the zoning regulations. And then after we approve the resolution, uh, Mr. Starnes has to go to the county and get them to agree to it as well. And once they sign the resolution, Mr. Starnes has 14 days based off of the statute to re record that with the register of deeds. That's uh, the simple portion of it. So if you have any questions for Mr. Starnes. I have questions for you, okay. uh, Mr. Edwards. In, in your professional opinion, are we um, opening a can of worms and setting a precedent to let folks pull out of Oak Island jurisdiction? That's my first question. Well, this only deals with split zoned properties where you've got two jurisdictions. Well, it's not split zones, but you've got two jurisdictional and one piece of property. So it would, this is sort of a, a unique situation. It's not very common. Uh, we, you know, you, you may see it on larger tracts of land, but back in, I believe it was 2009, and Lisa probably can correct me if I'm wrong on that date, but that was the year that a lot of the property owners out in Oakwood Glen, which is a neighborhood down Airport Road, and it's been there, gosh, since the late 80s. Know, yeah, years, but it would not be, I don't think you'd see a, a rush to 
people trying to get us to do. They, they'd have to be in this same situation that Mr. Starnes is in. So my second question is, when we're looking at this map, on the lower of the screen, it, the number 3440, and then on the upper part, number 37, 87, 67 or 87, are those Oak Island properties or are those county properties? Those are county properties. Okay, and then my final question is, do you, um, in your professional opinion, see any um, detriment or impact to neighbors by his property going into a county jurisdiction? I, I do not. The, the, the two adjacent properties and counting his own parcel there are already in the county. It just, they would be following county jurisdictions for development. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, question. And, and it's not a de-annexation of the portion that's in our corporate limits. Just want to make that clear. Right. He'll still pay taxes. But his whole property would become subject to Brunswick County Regulation Development Services. Yes. It would still be in our yeah. jurisdiction for tax purposes. Yeah. He's in. Our, he'll be in our tax jurisdiction still. Yeah, we were assured there'd be no financial impact. Right, there's the no town. financial impact. <clears throat> that is the case, right, Mr. Roberts? That is my understanding, correct? And what happens to the code violation? It would. The county doesn't require permits for driveway, so it would it would go away. Disappear. Right. We would have to repeal it because we no longer have jurisdiction. We did not receive a permit, a request for a permit on this. He was working under the guise of being in the county when he did it, and the county doesn't require a drive. I, I don't want to speak for Mr. Starnes on yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I, my understanding was. I thought I was county, so I didn't get one. Surprise, you're split. I had one, <laughs> I had one partial, so I just do, thought. Do you need to introduce yourself? I'm Donald you Storms, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Mr. Starnes? No. Mr. Starnes? Yes, sir. Do I understand that from February 21st until May 24th, they sent you seven violation notices? Mm, not that I know of. I've got one certified and one not that I that I remember getting. Page 112. And these just go away. Okay. See, these just go away. Uh, yes, ma'am. We would no longer have jurisdiction over them. Any other questions by council? Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution assigning jurisdiction for planning and development regulations to Brunswick County for that parcel 220NA021 within the town of Oak Island. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Opposed? Mr. you waited that long. Four to one. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Consideration of requests for proposals for legal services. Oh, that's okay. right. We get to skip ahead. Yeah, so uh, we've discussed on previous occasions uh, preparing an RFP um, and issuing it for uh, legal services. Uh, this came in a discussion about updating all our contracts and proposals and such. And so I drafted a um, an RFP, and um, I've got a slideshow, but I don't have a um, I don't have a clicker. I do. Oh, I do. You we'll do have it. a clicker. Real has. To, give me a click. It's easy too. Um, just thinking that looking at this on the screen is going to be easier than flipping pages. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank my fellow council members for their comments and for responding, um, as well as the interim manager for. Uh, providing comments to the RFP and it's not my job to make the decision about which comments get accepted and which don't so they're here tonight for discussion and uh, a decision <coughs> 
So in section number one, um, there was a comment that the link that was listed on the North Carolina Interactive Purchasing System did not work. Do we even advertise there? I'm sorry, I don't know because I don't usually handle the advertising for that. No, okay, that. so if, if we don't, the link, not, the, link can, yeah, the link can come out. Um, and then we have three comments that we can get all at one time. Section 1.3, section 2.1, and 3.5. Um, three counselors asked to have the mayor removed as the point of contact. So the question to be answered is, who is council's pleasure for the point of contact? I think the... Well, first of all, I think both names should appear, but the point of contact should be the administration, and I think the interim manager has indicated that would be the clerk. Is that correct? I don't want to... Clerk, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so that means that the clerk is willing to accept, um, to hold a pre-bid conference and accept questions, answer questions, if they come in from proposers. We haven't specified now that you'll handle that. So we, we might also need to change that. Well, for the for the response to the RFP, okay. the mailing and any legal notifications to go to the clerk. Okay, very good. Oh, just one quick thing, Terry, and you may have mentioned it and I missed it. That link also shows up in section 4.4. Okay. Just good, so you're aware. Good catch. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, let's move on. Uh, section 2, 2.2, um, which is on page 190 of your agenda packet. Councilor Bach requested adding a clause to indemnify staff legally if acting in good faith. That seems like a very reasonable statement to add in there. I would ask Mr. Eads if he could, could uh, provide that sentence or statement for, for the RFP. Unless Mr. Bach has a recommendation. No, I, th it's, I think it's a necessary protection um, for those who are taking actions on our behalf. And it's pretty much standard practice as I understand it. So is it it's consensus then that we add some kind of statement about uh, in, indemnifying the staff legally? Is that? I just want to make sure I understand what... <clears throat> If you're, if you're asking me to draft up that clause, I'm going to make sure I, I understand the request. I thought I heard you mention my name, did you? Mean? I was just asking if you wanted to provide the legal language for that or if, or if you want us, you know, I'm happy to the put, first two, put uh, something two, in there. To indemnify staff. Does this 2.2 on the PowerPoint correspond to? It does. Okay. So under 2.2, I have 11 items listed, and Councilor Brock is suggesting there be a, a 12th item that states that we indemnify staff legally if they are acting in good faith. Are you saying the town would indemnify staff if they're acting in good no, faith? No, the, pro the proposer, the legal firm. I'm, I'm, am yeah. I correct? The legal if, firm? Uh, Can you give me a scenario you're talking sure, about? Sure, Mr. Edwards is sued because some homeowner doesn't like a determination he made and it ends up going to court and he acted in good faith and according to our ordinances, he should be defended by you, your firm. Right. That, that I don't know that that should be in... Um, this document, that should be in a town policy document. That's what I thought. Okay, fine. Okay. I just want to make sure that protection is there. Or for I guess the staff. contract services once. Because this is an RFP. RFP. So, right. okay. yeah, okay. I mean, that's a town. Okay. I, I don't think you're saying that you, you're going to delegate that power to the town attorney, right? You're saying it's the town's position that if a staff member gets sued and they're acting in good faith, they will be identified by the town. Is right. that what you're I was presuming by town council, but okay, that's fair enough. Indemnified in the sense of being paid money or there's a difference between being indemnified and being defended. Okay. I, I, my intention was defended. Okay. <clears throat> I 
mean, that's that's normal. Right, because people are extraordinarily litigious, and right. they often just sue because they don't like a decision you made. And our and our we're presently with the the interlocal risk financing fund of North Carolina, which is administered by the League of Municipalities. Their their pool coverage or insurance coverage, it's really a risk pool, not in traditional insurance, has that language in there. Like in historically when the town's been sued and a lot of times it'd be the building inspector, the the league provides that coverage to both. Okay. But, but in terms of providing um, a scope of work that we want a, a legal firm to uh, submit a proposal on, could we say that part of their scope of work is to defend town employees who are involved in litigation? Who are involved in litigation if they were acting on good faith in their job responsibilities? Yeah, in their capacity I, as an employee. Yeah, I, I, I would recommend you include that in section 10. Represent the town. You could put and its town staff and employees acting in good faith <clears throat> for court, administrative hearings, and other business matters as deemed appropriate. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It does says it does say on one ninety, not limited to the following responsibilities. And just from a legal perspective, if you sue a town employee in his or her official capacity, the court deems that to be a suit against the town itself already. Okay. But there's no there's no issue with adding it to subsection t or section ten there. Item also in section 2.2, Councillor Bach requested adding a clause that the town may expand scope of services subject to negotiation. I think that makes Again, it's, it, it yeah. covers events, potential. Sentence of the paragraph below that kind of does that not address it? Town of Sherry provide legal services, such not matters covered. not covered above, but which necessitates legal advice. I don't know, maybe that's too detailed. Yes, yeah. it does. You're it right, does. it's already covered. I think we're okay. You think it's covered? Yeah. Are you satisfied with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, section 2.2, number 11. Councilor Kraft suggested the wording is misleading um, because it makes the prospect think they will be required to attend all advisory board meetings instead of the words as necessary. You suggested saying infrequently as needed. So right now we say, it's on page 190, we say advisory board and committee meetings as necessary. Can we just say as needed or I'm good infrequently with... is kind of a strong word. <clears throat> as needed, it's fine. That covers the, right, because we know they're going to be attending all town council meetings, all board of adjustment meetings right. at a minimum. And if the planning board had something major, yep. that would be as needed. Do we want to be more specific and say attend town council meetings, board of adjustment meetings, and then other advisory board and committee meetings as needed? I like that. Yeah, that sounds I think good. That's where you need to be. That's where yep. we are. All right. And, and technically, the board of adjustments not advisory, so I would just say town board and committee meetings that's more okay uh, section 2.3 which is on page 191 um, Councillor Bach had suggested a five-year minimum instead of a 10-year um, there was no basis for the 10-year it's whatever the pleasure of the council is I mean are we are we anticipating that a individual attorney would respond i would think that attorneys in this field of expertise are represented by a firm and that the firm is going to have multiple attorneys that represent decades of experience that was the only thing i when i read that i'm like what's the clarification here are we are we thinking that an individual is responding or are we just we believe firms are going to be responding well i don't i don't think our intention is to prohibit an individual right. from responding if they if they want to 
I think you're right, uh, Councilman Martin. I think it likely will be firms, but uh, within a firm there are options, and I wanted to make sure that we didn't spec it so high that we were going to cut off potential service. From oh, I see. Okay. And I think so you're, that you're even five years suggestion was assuming that it was still coming out of a firm. Yes, but I, okay. I think Terry plugged a number there, and why ten, not five? Why not seven? Yeah. Five seemed reasonable to me. Yeah. Okay. It'd be I'll, five and I'll go be five. 40 if you put them all together. Yeah. Is, it, is that good okay. with everybody? So five. Okay. Mr. Eats. Yes, ma'am. Is, is there um, a certification or a training for municipal attorneys that's recognized in your field? If there is, I haven't seen one, but that's going to be more than, most likely more than 10 years. I mean, like you can be a... a, a, a North Carolina State Bar Certified Real Property Specialist. I don't know that I've ever seen one for a municipal attorney, but that's Just not. Just curious. Well, we, I mean, we, we are specifying in the RFP legal experience in the practice of North Carolina municipal law. Um, practice in of North Carolina municipal law is required. Right. So, but that, there's a difference between that and being, or you know, certified by the state bar as a specialist. Okay, but you're advising against. Requirements. The way you have it now, I think, is fine. I do okay. have. You're saying it's a pretty high bar. Okay, yeah. I was just curious. We got some good language in there already. Okay. Uh, section three point one, um, Councillor Bach requested to add the language that invoices are to be submitted at the end of the month with due dates listed. Um, I guess my question is, would that be more part of the contract? I think or so. we want to put that expectation out there at the beginning. <coughs> well, either way, but I think contract. we need that. Okay. Predictable billing cycle. Put that in the contract. Okay. Does the interim manager have a recommendation there? Because you're handling billing right now. Monthly, uh, bi-monthly, what's, what's reasonable? Uh, even quarterly is fine, but I agree it should be in a contract, not in an RFP. So, but a predictable okay. schedule. Okay. Uh-oh. Um, oh, backwards. Sorry about that. Uh, 3.5 uh, requested adding language about our expectations for response to our request. And that actually goes along with a general question that it's at the end. Um, should the RFP indicate from whom the attorney will take direction, from whom the attorney will report to, uh, council hires and fires the attorney, but we have some logistics that, and that may not have been your, yours may have been more a time schedule about it expectation. Was. Okay. But we can put that in the contract. Contract. Okay. I do think, though, that um, we should, and we don't have to do it tonight, but we should agree on a protocol because attorneys are billing you per request per hour, right? And so is that the manager, the mayor, is that a council member who has the approval of the council who's, you know, working on a problem? We need to decide how that works because that drives billing, right? Does it go through the mayor? What, how is that handled? What's the conduit? I would think mayor and manager. Fine. Yeah, so then there were just some general questions that I put at the end. Um, you know, we, ha we haven't stated anywhere in the RFP that the attorney is accountable to the entirety of council. So the question is, do we need to, do we need to state that somewhere in our, probably would be in the introduction somewhere? It should mirror what's in our charter. Is everyone in agreement with that? Yeah. Okay. Keep us out of trouble or not. Uh, I keep going backwards, sorry. And we talked about should the RFP indicate from whom the attorney will take direction. I, I think we do need to be clear about that mm -hmm. because every time somebody contacts them, it's going to be a billable. <laughs> it's Absolutely. A billable hour. In tenths of an hour, yeah. Right. So is that something that's um, best done mm -hmm. in the RFP? Mm -hmm. 
or something that would be in the contract Track. contract contract, contract. contract. Thank you Uh, will the selected attorney or firm be used for public safety issues, or will the town continue to use the other group we currently consult with on police and fire issues? And I would defer to the manager on that. That has been working very well, okay. um, so I would not Just recommend changing the police and fire it the issues okay. at this time. But you don't preclude this attorney either, so I would just leave it out because they're. It's also a very highly out. specialized field. Yeah. Yeah when Leave access it. to this attorney needs to be 24 7 yep. which is what the service provides yep. so and police and fire have access to other legal services at a very reduced rate yep. um, okay. and they a lot of them take advantage of that so. i would say both it has worked happy. quite well and chief yep. morris is pleased with yeah. being able to get very specific advice perfect and then the last question that I received was um, did this RFP start from an existing draft from another municipality and the answer is yes I obtained it from the League of Municipalities it was a current RFP for a town a little larger well larger not a city but a town larger than Oak Island but um, that's where this came from so I'm not that smart work <laughs> Great start. And thank you for that effort. Thanks. So with those changes, then, um, Lisa, I'll be happy to make those changes, and I'll send you a clean copy. And, sure. and uh, Here, Just one question. And I may not, not have given you this feedback, but I have um, a concern if we send this out and allow an a single attorney, a sole practitioner, to respond to this and could potentially get us into a bind that we're in right now, as opposed to a law firm period and not a single attorney. I, I meant to get that to you and I apologize for that. Okay. I, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a preference. I look to you So is that time. part of the selection process? Is that a criteria yeah. for I, selection? I would think that'd be well, part of our selection. But even selection. the RFP, yeah. to dissuade as, you know, a sole practitioner from applying or from completing an RFP, thinking he or she is, might potentially be considered. Um, again, gets us in a bind if something is, um, death of disability, um, accident, illness, you know, it puts us in a big bind for dealing, dealing with a solo practitioner. I think typically it will be affirmed, but if you want to yeah. spec for that, it's fine. You can and, say it's preferable. Yeah. And preferable. over two decades of working in local municipal governments, I've never seen it not be uh, represented by a firm. Yeah. I've never seen an individual try to practice law and cover a town or a city. So it's just it's just hard. You just, it's very difficult to do. Well, you just keep that unless in they're in house, right? Unless they're in house, yeah. So that we don't uh, give the appearance that we're excluding anybody. Do you think it's okay to just say a uh, firm is preferable? Mm -hmm. And we got into the this, yeah. the semantics with the uh, town parking study. Yeah. About an RFP versus an RFQ. Can we just leave it as it is? That's fine. You know oh, just leave just it fine. and we'll evaluate yeah, what exactly. comes yeah. in. Exactly. Yeah. You know All right. Michael Absolutely. Jordan shows up, we'll deal with it. Yes. Perfect. The uh, other thing, it's not in my slides, but on page 193, I proposed a timeline. And um, I don't know if you all are, are okay with that. Um, Madam Clerk, you, you know, we have input into the, if we've allocated dates correctly or reasonably. I know that we had talked about having a July 1 target date to send this out. Yes, I will just tell you, I think the week of August 26th, toward the end of that week, I'm at conference. Okay. Um, but, you know, earlier in that week or the, early in the next week is would be fine. It, Teen, that's probably that's your deadline for the September agenda. Anything yeah. else anyone would like to have modified or clarified or no, but is is our plan to approve this as amended during the discussion or are you going to bring the completed uh, perfected text back at the next She's going to do it by July first. We gotta kind of pretty much a it, it tonight. If you all if you all trust me, I would be happy to do it as amended, and then um, 
I would ask Madam Clerk to send it out to everybody and let you get your eyes on it and make sure that I okay, picked so up everything. I'll make the motion to approve the RFP for legal as amended on the 18th, subject to final review by council. Second. Um, Thank you, Terry. Um, I would just like for us to give some consideration between now and before August 13th that um, I think it's helpful when we have criteria <coughs> for selection. Um, it helps us focus on what's important um, in making our selection. So that would be a recommendation for me, being process focused as I am. Close session. Pardon? We don't have a closed session tonight, or do we? Not that it, if not that 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 so. there's um, no one has said anything to me. Anything it's a placeholder, right? Yeah. yeah, it's a placeholder. Okay. So, so do we like have a meeting to Would you like adjourn? to make a motion, Councilman? I thought you might. Oh, you want me to do it? I'll, I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Favor? Good job, Mark. What on earth were you waiting for? <laughs> I thought you said, would you like me to make a motion? I thought you were wanting to make the motion. It's Thank okay. you very much, everyone. Mark, go home.